Just how far have tanks come? How do the descendants of the best World War II tanks stack up to each other? What if Zelda was a girl? There's few tanks more instantly recognizable than the mighty American Abrams, having earned the gold twice in the global turn Russian tanks into scrap metal Olympics, and now making its debut in Ukraine in a bid to clinch a third win. In Desert Storm, the Abrams absolutely annihilated its Soviet-made T-72 counterparts. While the Soviets weren't exporting their best variants to Iraq, the apocalyptic loss ratio alarmed many in Moscow. In World War II, America took a different approach to making its tanks, though. Today, for the U.S. Defense Department, if a new weapon system isn't at least 35% reverse-engineered UFO technology, it's garbage not worth fielding. In World War II, though, America took the modest, adequate route. Sure, the tanks were called Zippos by the Germans because of how often they lit up from a single shot, but the U.S. had five times the tanks of the Germans. And mass speaks on its own when it comes to armor warfare. The infamy of the Sherman is likely due to a misunderstanding of how the tanks were actually employed. It's no secret that their crews were so skeptical of its armor that they welded spare tracks to the front plate, and that didn't do very well against the late war German tanks. But that's because the Sherman wasn't meant to kill tanks. The Sherman was instead supposed to directly support the infantry, taking on fortified positions and lightly armored vehicles. To take out enemy tanks, the US used tank destroyers or air power. By the end of the war, the Sherman was sporting 63.5mm front armor, sloped to give an effective protection of 93.1mm. The Sherman was a medium tank and was designed under strict guidance as to a total height, width, and weight, so it would be able to cross most bridges and could be transported via road, railway, and landing craft easily. This was the key to the Sherman's success, as Allied forces using the vehicle had far more flexibility and mobility than their Axis counterparts. This kept the Sherman's total weight to 30 tons and made it a nimble machine. During the course of the war, the Sherman could get places and exploit opportunities other tanks couldn't. In Italy, Axis leadership commented that the Sherman could move up mountains and their own tanks couldn't. Topping out at 29 miles per hour with a range of up to 150 miles, the Sherman was an agile armored monster with a capable if not excellent gun. By the time it came to design the Abrams, the US had decided that every American preferred the world's best tanks over having basic medical care. Design philosophy changed from let's make adequate tanks and win through superior numbers to let's field tanks that will inspire Norse apocalyptic folklore. So how did the two tanks stack up? First let's compare their camouflage. Strange to talk about hiding an armored behemoth, but war is about exploiting every minute advantage. Sherman's came standard out of the factory in olive drab paint with a white star on the side. The Abrams utilizes one of three NATO standard patterns, but also employs a multi-spectral camouflage system to help hide the vehicle from infrared radar and millimeter wave radar imaging. We know this system is very effective, as a similar system has been deployed by Russia in Ukraine, and it's had a significant impact on the targeting range of the Javelin anti-tank missiles. If it got into trouble, the Sherman could burn oil in its engine to create an effective smokescreen and the incendiary rounds it carried could also create smaller but similar effects. The Abrams would like to remind everyone that it isn't in danger. It is the danger, but that it does still have two six-barreled smoke grenade launchers, one on each side. These are designed to expel a volley of air-bursting smoke grenades that surround the vehicle, shielding it from both regular and infrared observation. When it comes to armor, the Sherman is equipped with 63.5mm thick armor made up of hardened steel plates. The Abrams, by comparison, uses a secret armor composition, so secret that due to the worry of it falling into Russian hands, the US had it ripped off of all the Abrams sent to Ukraine. Its whole thickness and slope give the Abrams frontal protection of around 900mm, and the use of depleted uranium in the armor not only makes the tank one of the best protected in the world, but it'll kill any enemy that lingers in its immediate vicinity for the next few hundred years. Extra protection is offered by the addition of explosive reactive armor panels. To take out the same man-portable anti-tank threats the Sherman could do little about, the Abrams is also being fitted with the Trophy Active Protection System. The Abrams 120mm cannon is enough to give the Sherman 76mm cannon performance anxiety. It also fires depleted uranium anti-tank rounds known as silver bullets for their one-shot kill capability on Russian tanks even from incredible ranges. The Abrams is a world away from its Sherman Boomer grandparent and represents a fundamental shift in design philosophy from quantity to quality. The Panzerkampfwagen, or the Panzer, as people not perpetually angry 24 hours a day might say it, is one of the most legendary tanks of World War II and feared across the world. 
It was Germany's most produced tank, with 8,553 built during the entire war and rolling off assembly lines to liberate countries from themselves. It was a very reliable vehicle and stayed relevant all the way up to the 1967 six-day intense but brief disagreement between Israel and its neighbors. While it wouldn't be Germany's best tank, it was overall the best designed for the various needs of the German army. The Leopard 2 is Germany's current main battle tank and is soon probably Ukraine's too. The best way to gauge the Leopard's capabilities is to compare it on a battlefield where it's facing the opponent it was born to fight. Russian Armor Ukraine has kept operational details very secretive in order to deny Russia any information, but we know that a number of Leopards have been knocked out in pretty staggeringly low numbers. After about 13 weeks of combat operations, Ukraine had only lost 5 Leopards, with another 10 receiving significant damage. More importantly, reports tell us that most of the crews survived their vehicle's destruction, an altogether different fate from their Russian counterparts who often enjoy a brief but meteoric career in the Russian Air Force. It's clear the Leopard is making easy prey of its Russian counterparts, but how does it compare to the overall best German tank of the World War II era? The Leopard features spaced, multi-layer armor that combines steel plates of varying hardness, elastic materials, and ceramics. A Leopard defeats incoming rounds with smarts. The varying composition of its armor works to defeat the projectile itself and the resulting effects. Its thickest plate is estimated to be 800 mm, 10 times thicker than its Panzer counterpart at 80 mm. Also equipped with blowout panels, the Leopard is designed to prevent dangerous secondary explosions, which Russians decided should be a design feature. Mines were lethal to a Panzer and its crew. On the other hand, we have reports from Ukraine of the Leopard shrugging off anti-tank mines. The floor of the Leopard is sloped by 45 degrees and reinforced to protect the crew. Even if a landmine scores a mobility kill, the crew inside is protected and probably pretty angry. That matters because that crew can still operate the 120mm smoothbore gun. The Panzer used a 75mm gun, which was formidable, though not the most powerful Germany would field. Unlike its grandfather, the Leopard can also fire a much wider variety of rounds, bringing the pain in a rainbow of flavors. While the Panzer weighed in at a svelte 25 tons, the Leopard comes in at an average of 66 tons, over twice the weight while still outpacing its Panzer ancestor at a blistering 43 miles per hour versus 26 miles per hour. The Panzer was a reliable, easy to use, easy to maintain, and nimble tank, making it Germany's best tank of the war. And the Leopard continues a tradition of combining nimbleness with lethality. The Russians loved their T-34 tank so much that they busted it out again in the invasion of Ukraine. A medium tank, the T-34 was the backbone of the fierce Soviet counterattacks to push the Germans out during World War II. Eventually outgunned and outarmored, nonetheless, the T-34 made an immediate and lasting impression on the Germans. Today, Russia's most capable tank is the T-90. Yes, Russia has revealed a next-generation tank with the T-14. But given that Russia is propaganda and its equipment seems to be disintegrating in the face of Western arms, we aren't taking any claims about the T-14 seriously until it shows up on the front lines. So how good is the T-90? Well, it's hard to tell, because Russian tankers are amongst the worst in the world, and many of Ukraine's kills are due to the vehicle simply being poorly employed. However, at least one video showing the sudden and complete disassembly of a T-90 to a single anti-tank missile doesn't really put expectations very high either. In the Defense Department, the T-90 features explosive reactive armor with about 550 millimeters of armor underneath. During the First Chechen War, T-90s were routinely destroyed by the use of two or three RPGs. The first would detonate the explosive reactive armor, then a follow-up hit in the same spot would kill the tank, though sometimes two were needed. This doesn't speak well for the actual armor, though we do have accounts of a T-90 enduring seven RPG shots, though that account comes from a Moscow publication so take it with a grain of salt. In Iraq, the US documented strikes involving up to 50 RPGs against a single Abrams, including hits on the thinner side armor. While the T-34 was an impressive and capable tank, modern Russian engineering hasn't quite kept pace with the West. The T-90 does feature an impressive gun with a 2A46M 125mm smoothbore. This is in comparison to the 76.2mm F-34 gun on the T-34. Like any modern tank, the T-90 can fire a variety of different munitions, even including an anti-tank guided missile, which can also be used to take on helicopters. This makes it unique amongst modern tanks, as Western tanks forego this capability and instead take the more traditional kinetic approach to tank combat. 
While their grandfathers were forced to peer through periscopes or small slits in the armor, the T-90 features night vision and thermal imagers, or at least it did until Russia got cut off from Western supplies. Reports coming out of the Russian military state that many new tanks coming off the line now are only fitted with gunner sights. That would actually not be too far off from the plight the Soviet Union found itself in when tanks were rolling off the assembly line and into combat without so much as a coat of paint. Its diesel engine delivers the combined power of 1130 horses, at least in latest variants. The T-34, meanwhile, was barely even trying, puttering out 500 horsepower. That gave it a top speed of 33 miles an hour. Respectable for the era, Russia saw no need to outdo itself, so the T-90 tops out at about 37 miles per hour. If reports are to be believed, the T-90 has been in service alongside its great-grandfather, the T-34, marking the first such occasion in history. Because, you know, the Russian army wasn't suffering enough cataclysmic combat losses against a far inferior power already. The last time the T-34 prowled the fields of Ukraine, it was a predator to be feared by the advancing German armies. This time, it's a symbol of a decrepit, morally and economically bankrupt nation a sliver of its former glory. But this shouldn't undermine the value of the T-34 in its day. It was a particularly nasty surprise to the German military, which had grown accustomed to roundly defeating outdated and obsolete tank designs still in service. While it wouldn't be the most armored or well-armed that the Soviet Union put on the battlefield, it excelled like the Panzer by being reliable, mobile, and resilient, even in the harsh environment of the Eastern Front. The T-90, on the other hand, is a capable tank, but its battlefield record, even when accounting for poor training and poor doctrine, makes the tank a truly middling vehicle. Its advantage is it's cheap enough to be affordable, at about $1.5 million less than a Leopard 2 and about half the cost of the $9 million Abrams. That's a good thing, because you're gonna need a lot of T-90s to knock out an Abrams or a Leopard. Though, as both sides showed during World War II, when it comes to tanks, quantity has a quality all its own. The end of America's war in Vietnam saw a U.S. military in crisis. Its morale all but depleted and its combat experience watered down by massive conscription. In the years that followed, the Pentagon focused on restoring America's military by returning to an all-volunteer force and addressing the problems of systemic drug abuse and a weak officer and non-commissioned officer corps. But just how well would America's military fare in a new conflict after years of neglect and waste? 20 years after Vietnam, the world would get to find out, as America's forces were immediately thrown into the last of the greatest tank battles of the 20th century. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Infographic Show. Today we're taking a look at the Battle of 73 Easting and how America proved once more it was a force to be reckoned with. The First Gulf War, or Operation Desert Shield and later Desert Storm, was the last major war of the 20th century. Fought between Iraq and a coalition of over 30 nations, it was ultimately a test not just of America's post-Vietnam War military, but of the UN as a world peacekeeping organization. With the potential to escalate to an all-out regional conflict between Arab states, failure to contain Iraq's hostility would have signaled to the world that even after decades of work, the UN was just as a lame duck at global peacekeeping as the League of Nations before it. But how did the war start? Iraq's belligerence towards Kuwait started toward the end of the Iran-Iraq War, a brutal conflict that lasted for eight years. During the conflict, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia had backed Iraq financially, lending it billions of dollars. After the war, Iraq complained to the Arab League that its debts should be forgiven as it had acted in the foreign policy interests of both Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, who feared a growth of Iranian Shia influence amongst their own Shia populations. Iraq also raised concerns that both nations were producing more oil than the agreed-upon OPEC production limits, which was lowering the price of oil and costing Iraq billions. Lastly, Iraq specifically leveled charges against Kuwait that it was exploiting Iraqi natural resources by slant drilling across its northern border into Iraq's Rumelia oil field, in essence drilling diagonally to bypass national borders underground. If you've seen There Will Be Blood, it's the milkshake scene. Iraq did not like Kuwait drinking its milkshake one bit. And after the Arab League refused to act, Iraq, prompted by those and other grievances, launched a ground invasion of Kuwait, annexing the nation as a province of Iraq. For its part, the United States had long tried to broker a settlement in the region. But when Iraq linked its grievances with enforcing a resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, 
The US refused to negotiate, yet the United States remained reluctant to commit to military force and ultimately it was Great Britain's Margaret Thatcher who reminded US President George Bush Sr. about the consequences of inaction during Germany's hostilities prior to World War II, most famously by telling the US President not to go wobbly. Wobbly President Bush would not go, and he immediately demanded an exit from Kuwait by Iraq. With Iraq poised to invade Saudi Arabia and seize control of over 65% of the world's oil-producing fields, the US and other allied nations had pre-deployed several hundred thousand troops to Saudi Arabia as part of Operation Desert Shield. On the eve of war, these troops were reinforced with detachments from many NATO and non-NATO nations, including several Arab League nations, which President Bush had insisted on joining so the conflict would not be seen purely as West versus Arab. When Iraq refused to withdraw from Kuwait, the US launched Operation Desert Storm on the 17th of January 1991 and the Battle of 73 Easting, the last great tank battle of the 20th century, soon followed. So who were the combatants and what weapons was each side bringing to the fight? On the defending side was Iraq's fearsome Republican Guard, with the best training and equipment available to the Iraqi forces. The Republican Guard had been a force to be reckoned with during the Iran-Iraq War, responsible for some of Iraq's greatest victories. It was these elite soldiers who were dispatched to be the first to meet the American advance. And American war planners had estimated that defeating the Republican Guard forces would be a costly victory, even weakened as they were by weeks of aerial bombardment. The Republican Guard brought the vaunted Soviet-built T-72 main battle tank to the battle. A stalwart of Soviet design philosophy, the T-72 brought few innovations but was a solidly built and capable tank. With a 125mm cannon, one 7.62mm and one 12.7mm machine gun, the T-72 may have been nearly two decades old, but it was still a formidable threat. Its cannon had exceptional accuracy and firing rate both, with up to 8 rounds a minute or 1.2 rounds if loaded manually and an armor penetration of 590 to 630 millimeters at 2,000 meters. On the defensive, a T-72's frontal armor was 200 millimeters thick and capable of stopping a direct hit from an M1 Abrams from 2,000 meters away. The T-72's greatest weakness, however, was its lack of thermal vision systems and very poor night vision capabilities, which were a crippling deficiency in combat. Supporting its T-72 tanks were mechanized infantry deployed in Soviet-built BMP-1 infantry fighting vehicles, equipped with a 73mm semi-automatic cannon and a 7.2mm coaxial machine gun. BMPs not only protected squads of soldiers that rode inside of them, but were capable of taking on lightly armored vehicles themselves. Iraq's Republican Guard BMPs were also equipped with 9M14 and 9M113 Conker's anti-tank wire-guided missiles, making them an agile threat to American tanks. Its 33mm thick armor plating provided protection from 7.62 armor-piercing rounds, and in a limited degree of fire, even 50 caliber machine gun fire. Like the T-72, however, Iraq's BMPs lacked thermal imaging capabilities or capable night vision sight factors, which would be decisive throughout the Gulf War. Facing off against Iraq's fearsome Republican Guard were elements of the US Army's Seven Corps to include the 1st through 3rd Armored Divisions and the 1st Infantry Division. Having seen no major action since the end of the Vietnam War, America's newly reminted all-volunteer army had some serious proving to do. Yet the US Army had spent the last two decades drilling out its conscript force and restoring the capabilities and expertise of its leadership at the non-commissioned and commissioned levels, as well as engaging in routine exercises with NATO partners to stop a Soviet incursion through the Fulda Gap. The Seven Corps brought to bear the now legendary but as of then untested M1A2 Abrams. Designed in response to Soviet deployments of new main battle tanks, the M1A2 hosted a slew of revolutionary features, most notable of all being its Chobham armor, of which it was the first tank deployed which incorporated it. Still a classified secret, Chobham armor is a composite armor made up of steel plates layered with ceramic inserts and empty spaces meant to defeat anti-tank missiles and rounds by deflecting or redirecting explosive blasts and kinetic penetrators. It also featured layers of depleted uranium armor, making it one of the toughest fighting vehicles ever created. Its 120mm cannon is paired with a fire control computer which aids a gunner by calculating lead angle, ammunition type, and range to a target. 
a feature missing from Iraq's T-72s. The M1A2 also featured thermal and night vision imaging, as well as laser rangefinders, all features that would prove decisive in the deserts of Iraq. The 7 Corps infantry were supported by M2 Bradley fighting vehicles, armed with a 25mm automatic cannon with a firing rate of up to 300 rounds a minute, and a tow missile launcher. M2s were heads and shoulders above Iraq's BMPs and capabilities. Its aluminum armor is reinforced with laminate belts and steel skirts capable of stopping up to 50 caliber rounds and even offering some protection from long-range tank fire. M2s are equipped with both thermal and night vision imaging, once more granting them a major advantage over Iraq's BMPs. In total, American forces numbered at around 4,000 versus the Republican Guard's 2,500 to 3,000 personnel. Yet with well-prepared defenses and boasting the fourth most powerful military in the world at the time, the advantage was with Iraqi forces and American military planners expected heavy casualties in the ensuing action. The Battle on the 23rd of February, American forces swept into southern Iraq. A frontal push by armor was coordinated with a sweeping hook meant to encircle Iraqi forces from behind and attack from their flanks. The initial action saw stunning American victories, with 55 Iraqi tanks and 45 armored vehicles destroyed, along with hundreds of enemy KIA and the surrender of 865 prisoners. The next day, elements of the 7 Corps swept into northern Kuwait to sever Iraqi lines of communication and block the retreat of Iraqi forces. Another 50 enemy vehicles were destroyed, along with 1,700 prisoners captured. Moving to block further American advances and to secure their supply routes, Republican Guard forces took up positions along roadways, expecting an American attack to come along major roads, as they did not think anyone would be able to navigate the featureless desert. Unfortunately for Iraq, American forces were equipped with GPS, at the time a relatively new feature on armored vehicles, which allowed them to surprise Iraqi forces from unexpected avenues of attack, originating deep in the desert. On the 26th of February, 7 Corps' 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment was ordered to advance up to 70 Easting, an eastward measured distance designated by GPS, and engage the Republican Guard without becoming decisively engaged so they could retain their maneuverability. At 16.07 p.m., E Troop of the 2ACR equipped with 9 Abrams, 12 Bradley fighting vehicles, and 220mm mortars made first contact with the enemy. The main Republican Guard force had been entrenched near a village on the other side of a small rise in the terrain in a reverse slope defense. Unaware of American GPS and expecting an attack to come along the main road, the Iraqi commander had dug in his 40 T-72s and 16 BMPs 1,000 yards from the ridge and created two engagement areas on the east side of the ridge and north and south of the village. He had also deployed several minefields which included both anti-personnel and anti-tank mines, and supported his armor with hundreds of infantry in hardened bunkers and trenches. A reserve force of 18 T-72s and more BMPs was held near his command post about 3,000 yards east. American forces arrived from out of the desert, not along the road as expected, catching the Iraqis completely by surprise. Destroying a bunker serving as an observation post by running over it, E-Troop's lead Bradley took two surrendering enemy soldiers prisoner. A second Bradley came under fire from Iraqi forces trying to reposition inside the village, and nine Abrams returned fire with high explosive rounds. Given the clear to advance, E-Troop reoriented so that its Abrams would lead the charge, with its Bradleys falling back to provide support. Cresting the rise north of the village, the Abrams made immediate contact with the T-72s entrenched there. Weather had been poor all day and visibility was very low, yet the Abrams were able to clearly see and target their T-72 opponents via their thermal sights, and with superior fire control and precision, eliminated all eight T-72s they encountered in under a minute. Advancing past the wrecked tanks, E-Troop immediately came under fire from more tanks, BMPs, and hundreds of infantry, all trying to reposition to meet the American attack. It was at this point that the E-Troop had reached their limit of advance, 70 Easting, which they had been ordered not to exceed, with further orders to not become decisively engaged. This point in the battle, perhaps more so than the superior performance of American vehicles, proved to be decisive, as the commander of the E-Troop, then Captain, today National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, disobeyed orders and commanded his troops to press the attack. 
This may seem like a court-martial worthy offense, and certainly in many of the world's militaries it would be, except the US military has for a long time embraced a doctrine of flexibility which not only allows but encourages its junior officers to execute orders as they see fit. Recognizing the high-speed pace of modern war and acknowledging the often superior situational awareness of junior commanders, who were often on the front lines, the US military encourages its junior officers to take the initiative. This makes US forces extremely flexible and is often a deciding factor in modern combat. Iraqi forces on the other hand operated by a heavy-handed top-down command structure that severely limited individual officers' abilities to react to quickly changing situations. This Soviet-style command structure was most notably evident during the coalition's air war, during which US-led airstrikes severed communication links in Iraq's extremely robust air defense forces and rendered them extremely ineffective. At 70 Easting that day, this difference between command styles and military doctrines would prove to be as decisive a force as the mighty Abrams. E-Troop continued its advance toward the next ridgeline at the 73 Easting, on which were positioned the reserve force of 18 T-72 tanks. Still waiting for orders from their commander, the T-72s were caught completely unprepared, and the first of their numbers were destroyed from a range of about a thousand yards. The rest of the vehicles attempted to mobilize and exit the staging area, but American Abrams quickly crested the ridge and destroyed all of them at close range. Now occupying the high ground that the Iraqi forces had planned on using to dominate the Americans, E-Troop consolidated its position but came under attack by a company-sized force of T-72s and BMPs. The Abrams, backed up by Bradley's firing TOW missiles, made quick work of the enemy force before they could close, eliminating the entire counterattack from long range. Meanwhile, E-Troop's mortars suppressed enemy infantry, trying to mass further east, while artillery fire support rained down on other enemy positions. The Battle of 73 Easting lasted just over 23 minutes and resulted in an absolutely lopsided victory for American forces. Americans suffered 6 KIA and 19 wounded in bunker clearing operations by their infantry and one Bradley infantry fighting vehicle. Iraqi forces suffered between 600 to 1,000 KIA and WIA, 1,300 prisoners taken, lost 160 tanks, 180 personnel carriers, 12 heavy artillery pieces, and several anti-aircraft artillery repositioned to serve as ground fire support. The battle proved the superiority of the Abrams tank design and the effectiveness of its classified Shabam armor, which had not seen combat yet. Despite taking numerous direct hits from T-72s, not a single American Abrams was rendered inoperable or required major repairs. In fact, the only Abrams to be lost during the entire Gulf War would be to friendly fire. The battle also proved the effectiveness of other as-of-yet unbattle-tested systems, such as military GPS and new-generation thermal and night vision equipment. It proved the technological edge of American forces and ensured that all tanks built worldwide would include thermal and night vision equipment as a mandatory feature. The Battle of 73 Easting also proved the superiority of American military doctrine over Soviet doctrine. E-Troop's quick thinking and disobeying of previous orders had seized the advantage and prevented Iraqi forces from recognizing and mounting an effective counterattack. Catching the Iraqis deployed to fight along the wrong axis of battle had given American forces an insurmountable advantage. Iraqi positions simply could not have defeated the surprise attack deployed defensively as they were. But had E-Troop obeyed orders and not advanced past the 70 Easting, those same forces could have repositioned and regrouped, presenting a much more formidable challenge that could have seen them inflict more serious casualties on the Americans. The Battle of 73 Easting would have major repercussions around the world, with more militaries adopting a less centralized command structure, though traditionally conservative nations such as Russia and China still struggle to lend their junior officers the flexibility that is so obviously critical to success on the fast-paced modern battlefield. The battle and stunning outcome of American advances against Iraqi forces, who were at the time the world's fourth most formidable military, along with the results achieved by American weapons and equipment, also led Soviet observers at the time to declare that the only way to stop an American armored advance would be to use tactical nuclear weapons. It also proved that the decay of America's military brought on by the Vietnam War had been fully reversed.
and that it now fielded a professional and competent military that persists to this day. It's just days before Operation Overlord, better known in the history books as D-Day. Over one million men from five different nations will simultaneously launch several landings across the French coast, a military operation the likes of which has never been attempted before. Waiting across the English Channel are several hundred thousand German defenders sitting in heavily fortified bunkers, overseeing beaches littered with mines, barbed wire, and concrete tank traps. Hitler and his generals know that an invasion is coming. Up until now, the war has been largely Britain fighting for her life, with the Soviets in the Far East being easily defeated. The Americans have conducted several operations in Northern Africa with very mixed success, but now the bulk of their forces are finally in Britain, eager to join the fight. Any day now, the true battle of Europe will begin and the Germans hold all the advantages. Suddenly, German radio operators begin picking up radio chatter from American and British units. The operators are quick to identify several of the Allied units broadcasting, including several American and British infantry divisions, armored divisions, and even General Patton's headquarters itself. The alarm is immediately raised. Something big is going down, and soon. The Luftwaffe is ordered to put recon planes up into the air, and as they make the short trip across the channel, they take photos of column after column of tanks, trucks, and artillery, all lined up and ready to board landing craft. German Army Headquarters is immediately alerted to the pending invasion, and General Rommel himself orders reinforcements to rush to Calais, directly across from the preparing invaders. He even commits the bulk of his armor reserve to the area. The Allies must not be allowed to gain so much as a toehold on Europe. They must be met directly on the beach and thrown back into the ocean. Another reconnaissance flight over the massing forces is ordered, and the pilot confirms the locations of the Allied forces, reporting thousands of armored vehicles and trucks waiting to be loaded. As the plane turns around from overflying the massed troops, a stiff wind suddenly picks up and one of the tanks starts to float away. Hurrying, a soldier ducks out from under a tent and rushes to the tank, tying it down with a rope and securing it from the stiff breeze. Luckily, the German plane seems to have taken no notice of the peculiar incident. As Germany prepares to defeat the largest invasion in military history, there's just one problem. The American and British tanks and other vehicles are all made of rubber, barely more than inflatable balloons. The giant invasion army is fake a ploy engineered by the British and carried out with the help of the US's 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, and the real invasion force is massing right now for a landing dozens of miles away in Normandy. Known as the Ghost Army, the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops was a military outfit like no other. Its members were men specifically recruited from the world of advertisement, visual arts of all sorts, carpenters, and talented actors. Their job was simple fool the Germans by pretending to be something they were not, and the 1,100-strong unit was tasked with staging elaborate displays that would make the Germans believe they were facing a much larger threat than they really were, making use of inflatable tanks, rubber airplanes, and plywood artillery. Officially known as tactical deception, this elite troop of soldiers would be critical in confusing and confounding the German military throughout the course of the war. The Ghost Army ultimately staged 20 battlefield deceptions between 1944 and 1945. Their performances or illusions, as the members insisted on calling their cunning tricks, would often take place within just a few hundred yards of enemy lines, putting them in just as much risk as any regular soldier. Yet unlike regular soldiers, if the enemy didn't fall for the trick, they might be left with nothing more than rubber tanks to fight with. In order to fool the Germans, the Ghost Army created something called Atmosphere, a term familiar to any theater or film artist. In essence, Atmosphere simply means creating a believable tone or impression for the audience, and in this case, the audience was German military units and undercover spies. To do this, the members of the Ghost Army would wear uniforms from different military units and make sure they were seen marching by enemy scouts. The scouts would then return back to their headquarters and report that members of a specific unit were operating in the local area, while the real unit, along with all its firepower, was in actuality somewhere else entirely. This would lead the Germans to deploy their forces to defend from imaginary threats, fearing for instance an attack by an American armored division when in reality that same division was preparing to attack somewhere else far away. 
To help sell the illusion though, the soldiers of the Ghost Army would drive trucks or tanks, sometimes as few as just two, in constant looping convoys, creating the illusion of a much larger unit being transported to the front lines. The clever actors would also learn to impersonate radio operators from different units, mimicking not just their voice, but also the way that they sent Morse code messages, down to every minute idiosyncrasy of the specific operator. All these tiny details would add up to a very convincing deception, leaving the Germans utterly confused as to the real state of affairs across the combat front. Ghost Army soldiers would also put their acting talents to use in person, often spending time at French cafes near the war front, where they knew they would be overheard by German spies. The soldiers would wear uniforms of different infantry or armored divisions, again sowing confusion as to the true location of the real units, and they would talk loudly and openly about upcoming tactical operations. Commensurate actors, the Ghosters would learn their roles well, playing everything from overexcited new recruits eager to see their first combat and accidentally spilling operational secrets, to even high-ranking generals bragging about upcoming operations to pretty waitresses, while knowing that a German spy would certainly be within earshot. Sometimes though, it was just enough to be seen and not heard, and soldiers would often parade around pretending to be very high-ranking Allied officers, making German spies believe that major operations must be about to take place in areas where no such operations were being planned. If you've ever acted in a school play and thought it was nerve-wracking, imagine trying to play the part of a very high-ranking officer in World War II, knowing that your performance could save or doom thousands of lives. Ghost Army soldiers used every range of their artistic talent in the fight to liberate Europe, and this included audio engineers. Today you might hold yourself up in a room with some music software and cook up some sick beats to get a few likes on Facebook. But for the soldiers of the Ghost Army, creating convincing mixtapes made up of the sounds of different vehicles and tanks could mean the difference between life and death. These soldiers worked in conjunction with Bell Labs back in Fort Knox and recorded dozens of different types of military vehicles, everything from tanks to trucks and even jeeps. The recordings were written directly into wire recorders, bleeding edge technology at the time, and then transported to the battlefields of Europe. A modern DJ may have to mix different tracks together to entertain an audience, but in World War II, the Ghost Army's own DJs would be tasked with mixing all the different recordings of armored vehicles to create a realistic soundscape of an advancing army. If the recordings or the mixing just wasn't right, the entire ploy could collapse, and Ghost Army soldiers had to do this with primitive equipment mounted on the back of a half-track loaded with giant speakers. No doubt a difficult task. The tactic was nevertheless effective in fooling the Germans several times, and the recordings could be heard as far away as 15 miles, giving the impression of a very large force moving through the thick woods of Europe's forests. Another brainchild of the Ghost Army was spoof radio, and it used actors impersonating radio operators from other units. They would do everything from report fake troop movements to even calling in fake radio reports from imaginary combat zones complete with a soundscape of battlefield noises to make the performance believable. Thus, German units might be fooled into thinking that American forces were retreating by picking up the broadcast of a panicked soldier calling for a retreat, when in actuality the forces were digging in to lure the Germans into a trap, or weren't even in the area at all. The fake battlefield broadcasts also confused the Germans, making them believe that their own units, which were not engaged in battle, had been engaged. Confused German commanders would be forced to contact individual units to try and clear the fog of war, leaving opportunities for Allied troops to act before the Germans could properly react. Spoof radio was so successful that it even fooled Axis Sally, otherwise known as Mildred Gillers, an American woman turned Nazi propagandist. She would go on to report that an entire Allied division was preparing for battle at a place with no troops at all. Ghost Army soldiers would often protect other soldiers in a much more active way though. During D-Day and several other major operations, Ghost Army artists created realistic looking decoys that became tempting bombing and artillery targets for the Germans. This would include artillery emplacements, fake landing barges, and groups of parked vehicles. The elaborate displays would sometimes even be lit up with lights, as if someone was being accidentally careless, making them that much more tempting for the Germans to strike at. Attacks on these fake military positions saved countless Allied lives. Sometimes though, ghost soldiers would simply mirror pre-existing positions, such as artillery sites, diverting fire from the real emplacement, and once more, saving lives. As the fight for Europe moved to the east, so too did the Ghost Army. 
In September, after the D-Day landings, the Ghost Army impersonated the entirety of the 6th Armored Division, effectively plugging a gap in General Patton's assault on the French city of Metz. German forces looked for a vulnerability to exploit and instead were faced with a continuous line of American forces, leaving them no room to outmaneuver the American advance. Had the Germans not fallen for the ruse, they would certainly have broken through the American lines and flanked the real attack by General Patton, potentially dooming the entire assault. Imagine being the German general who would learn later after the war that rubber tanks were what defeated him in one of the pivotal battles for Europe. Yet, as impressive as the Ghost Army's deceptions were up to this point, one of their greatest illusions would take place toward the end of the war. In March 1945, Allied forces were preparing to cross the Rhine River and at last into the heart of Germany itself. Victory was within sight, if they could just get across the very heavily fortified Rhine. Any attempt to cross would be bloody, with casualties projected in the tens of thousands, and yet the attack was necessary to finally bring an end to World War II. The Ghost Army would play their part in the attack, and were tasked with the incredible job of simulating two entire infantry divisions, or about 20,000 men and all their equipment, with just 1,100 soldiers. The Ghost Army would set upon the impossible task with gusto, calling on every ounce of artistic creativity to fool the Germans into believing the main assault across the Rhine would come far away from the actual attack. To do this, they ran a mounting concert of radio broadcasts, simulating troop movements and orders between different brigade and division commanders, a performance that convinced the Germans real units were moving into the area. Across the river, the Ghost Army blasted its carefully mixed soundtrack of troops, vehicles and heavy equipment, making sentries posted along the Rhine believe that just across the river from them, the illusionary divisions were preparing for an attack. The deceit worked perfectly, and incredibly, when the real American units made their crossing of the Rhine, they encountered little, if any, resistance, laying bare Germany's heart. The Ghost Army is credited with saving tens of thousands of lives and helping ensure victory in World War II. Its soldiers were certainly cut from a different cloth, being professional and amateur actors, painters, and artists of all sorts, and bringing their incredible talents to their nation's aid in one of the darkest times in modern history. Their contribution to victory, however, is likely best immortalized in the results of the D-Day invasions, when even as the main assault force was making landfall in Normandy, the Germans refused to send reinforcements, believing the real attack to be a diversion for the fake attack by rubber tanks waiting for them across the channel. Congratulations, soldier! You've just been picked to be part of a four-man crew on an American Abrams main battle tank. That's right, you'll officially be on board one of the most powerful machines on Earth, a tank so tough that none have ever, in its entire lifetime, been destroyed by enemy fire. You may be a total badass on the battlefield, but buckle up, buttercup, because you're about to find out why life inside a tank sucks. Like tight spaces? We sure hope you do, because the first thing you're going to notice about life inside a tank is that there's not much room to move around. The total area for crew inside a tank is only a few square feet, and that's because as you begin your new life as a tanker, you very quickly realize that the machine comes well before the humans. After all, a modern battle tank can easily level an entire neighborhood block, while you probably struggle to fight your way out of a wet paper bag. So hopefully you're not claustrophobic, because not only is the interior of a tank an extremely tight squeeze, but it gets even worse when the tank is fully buttoned down. And that's only going to be most of the time, until scientists figure out how to make humans obsolete. A tank is only as functional as its soft, squishy human crew. So anytime you're cruising around in your big, bad battlemobile, you can be sure that you're going to be locked down and buttoned up tighter than Fort Knox. Nearly every modern battle tank can operate inside a nuclear, chemical, or biological environment, meaning that when these things seal up, we mean it. Hopefully you like that air you've been breathing because you're going to be breathing it over and over again for hours, potentially even up to two days straight. Scrubbers in the air filtration system will keep you from suffocating on your own carbon dioxide, but well, they don't work quite as well on other things, like smells. So go ahead and take a quick whiff of your armpit right now, then go ahead and close your eyes and imagine how bad you might stink after spending an entire day buttoned up in an airtight tank. Sure, modern tanks have air conditioning, but when it comes to a very long list of priority equipment and systems to keep well-maintained and repaired, uh, the AC comes in dead last. If you happen to have the luck of serving in a warm, tropical, or scorching hot desert environment, then you'll very soon understand what it feels like for cookies every time you stick them in an oven. Huffing down your own funk is bad enough, but with up to a four-man crew, you're going to have to get used to the particular flavors of your crewmates. 
For a good approximation of what that's like, next time you're around a sweaty friend, go ahead and stick your face in their armpit and then take several deep huffs of air. Hold it in. Really savor the sweat stank coursing down your esophagus and saturating your lungs with their salty stink. Let the vapors linger as they work their way back up your respiratory system and come up the back of your throat and into your mouth. Yeah, that's what living in a tank is like with three other guys. But as you check out the digs in your new battle ride, you might notice that there seem to be several critical amenities missing. You might pay upwards of $3,000 a month for the same square footage of an apartment in New York or San Francisco, but at least those places will come with a bathroom. Inside a modern tank, the only bathroom that exists is, well, the one you invent for yourself. Gotta pee? Old Gatorade bottle will do in a pinch. Just don't confuse it with, you know, your actual Gatorade. Gotta go number two, though? Well, there's a reason your crew commander warned you to save the plastic bag your MRE came in. That's right, even after 100 years of tank technological improvements and innovations, the best technique for taking a deuce in a modern tank is the age-old tradition of pooping in a bag. A modern tank may be the 70-ton embodiment of God's vengeful wrath on a sinful world, but while you're stuck in it, you're still pooping in your sandwich baggie. You can forget about hopping out so you can pinch a loaf off real quick from the side of the tank. Tanks operate on the most dangerous battlefields on Earth, and that means that the life expectancy of a tank crewman outside of his actual tank is vanishingly short. While you're living in a tank, you're going to be squatting your grumps in the tank, not outside of it. For our more astute viewers, this has likely already led to the question on many of your minds. What happens after you're done laying wolf bait? Like, what happens to it? Well, modern tanks are thankfully equipped with a trash incineration device that instantly disintegrates whatever trash the crew generates. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. That's right, over 100 years of tank design and still, the best solution to what happens after someone takes the Browns to the Super Bowl is to simply stow it away. That's tank speak for you're hanging onto your poop until it's safe to actually exit the vehicle. Hopefully your poop receptacle is airtight, but since you'll be using plastic sandwich baggies or plastic MRE bags, it most definitely will not be. At least try to tie a knot onto it and not repeat the unfortunate disaster aboard Apollo 10 when one of the astronauts Hershey's kisses started floating around the cabin. With all the shaking and banging a tank does as it moves around the countryside though, odds are eventually you're going to have a loose turd rolling around. Marinating in the smells of your crew's poop, urine, and sweat, though, is only some of the perks of getting to drive around in the most powerful machines on Earth, because the other perk is occasional and extremely excruciatingly painful injuries. As we've mentioned, the actual human crew is more of an afterthought for many tank designs, and in tanks like the German Leopard 2, it's all too easy for the crew to get seriously injured, if not killed, by their own machines. One German tanker was caught in the machinery of the turret and had his femur snapped cleanly in two, though broken arms, fingers, and even legs are not uncommon injuries for tankers. We seriously cannot overstate just how much you don't want to be in the way of a 70-ton murder machine. At least though, you'll get to make big bangs driving your tank around, and every time that big main cannon fires off, you can expect the cabin to fill up with cordite from the fired round. You can add that one to your laundry list of savory aromas you'll get to enjoy in your life inside a tank. Listen, there's one obvious perk to life inside a tank though, and that's mainly the fact that if you happen to be riding inside an American Abrams or a British Challenger, there's really not much on this modern battlefield that's going to be anything more than a pesky annoyance. Small arms fire? Kick your feet up as you enjoy the tin roof-like sound of high-caliber rounds plinking off your thick armor plating. RPGs? Those are cute, but I bet they would tickle a little bit if one hit you. They certainly tickled an American Abrams that took over 52 RPGs in one day and only suffered a thrown track. IEDs? Well, unless the IED is the size of, well, a tank, then it's not going to do much, but maybe scuff the paint. You may be feeling invulnerable, but you're also going to be a pretty priority target on any battlefield, and while anything we've discussed isn't going to do much but annoy you, there's plenty of weapons out there that can seriously crap up your day. You can be sure that if you're facing a modern or even close to modern foe, then you're going to have everything from bona fide anti-tank missiles to other tanks trying to knock you out of the fight. And while your thick armor may protect you from most things sent your way, even a hit that doesn't penetrate the armor can be deadly to the crew inside. That's thanks to spalling, or when a hit is absorbed by the tank's armor, but the energy actually causes the inside of the armor to fracture and fire off shards of razor-sharp metal inside the crew compartment. You really don't want to get in the way of 3-inch shards of scrap metal traveling a few dozen feet per second any more than you want to get your arms or legs in the way of the moving machinery inside the tank. 
Then there's the fact that any round that actually manages to penetrate the interior of a tank, well, it's not going to be particularly survivable for the crew. A fighter pilot can still eject if his plane is hit by a missile or gunfire, and even soldiers in a Humvee can be completely unharmed or just dazed if they roll over an IED. But if an anti-tank round hits your tank and penetrates, well, that kind of stuff is just simply not survivable. Humans are just too squishy. A high explosive round, for instance, may not be particularly effective against modern tanks thanks to modern armor, but if you're caught with your head out of the turret when it goes off, it's going to basically ruin your day by taking your head clean off. A high explosive squash head round, on the other hand, is going to very much ruin your day if you're sitting inside your tank. These rounds create a large surface explosion on the outside of the tank, which causes the metal armor on the inside to shatter and spall, showering the crew with high-speed shrapnel. The use of spaced armor has made these rounds less effective, but still a danger. If you come under fire from an armor-piercing discarding sabot round, however, you better hope your armor is up to manufacturer's specs, because if it's not, it's going to be your last day on Earth. These rounds use no explosives and instead fire a very thin needle-like projectile which penetrates through layers of tank armor. By the time the penetrator makes it to the interior of the tank, it's been fractured so badly that it turns into a deadly high-speed shower of razor-sharp shrapnel. If you're on the business end of a depleted uranium round such as those used by American tanks, then we hope you've got a solid last will and testament, because no known tank on Earth has survived a hit from one of those bad boys. Lastly, you've got high explosive anti-tank rounds to concern yourself with, which like to mix things up by providing a fun party mix of high-speed kinetic penetrator death along with high explosives. If the kinetic projectile that punches through your armor doesn't kill you, then the searing hot explosion that follows it certainly will. And if you happen to be running around with your own ammunition exposed, then you can be sure that the sudden rise in temperature to several hundred degrees will cause your ammo to cook off, further adding to the explosive death fun. At least it'll be quick. With the threat of instant death, absolutely zero legroom, and the joy of marinating in the poop smells of a four-man crew, you might be wondering who exactly would want to even serve as a tanker anyway. Well, sure, they're uncomfortable, dangerous, and a priority target on any battlefield, but they're also pretty much the most badass machines mankind has ever made, and that in itself is a compelling argument for putting up with pooping inside of a bag for days on end. A modern tank is, after all, the literal embodiment of the wrath of a vengeful god on a sinful world. And short of another even better tank, or perhaps serious air support, there's not much that's going to stop your rampage across a battlefield, and definitely not things as flimsy as buildings or walls. But a thrown track definitely will, and despite how tough modern tank armor is, the truth is tank treads might as well be made of eggshells for how often they get damaged or thrown. Even just taking a turn too sharp is enough for a tank to throw a track, and in that case, you can look forward to the fun of having to lift hundreds of pounds of metal tracks with just you and your crewmates as you desperately try to fix your busted track so your giant murder machine can actually move. But hey, at least then you could poop outside of the tank for a change. On a quiet morning in early June 2004, a bulldozer rumbled down the streets of Granby, Colorado. This bulldozer, however, was like nothing anyone had ever seen before. Heavily armored and resembling a moving fort, the giant beast smashed into City Hall and began to tear the small town of Granby to pieces. Police found their rifles, shotguns, and handguns to be completely ineffective against the heavily armored behemoth, and the Colorado governor made preparations to order the National Guard to send an Apache attack helicopter to destroy what would become known as the Killdozer. Three years before the armored rampage, Marvin Hemeyer was a well-liked and affable man who owned and operated his own muffler repair shop. Having bought the land on which his shop was built back in 1992, Hemeyer had recently agreed to sell the land to a concrete company, which was looking to build a new plant in the area. Despite the town's approval, as the plant would bring many new jobs to the area, the negotiations, however, had been difficult, and Hemeyer and the concrete company failed to come to an agreeable price for the land over and over again. Originally, having bought the land for $42,000, Hemeyer agreed to sell the land for $250,000, only to change his mind and increase the price to $375,000. After more back-and-forth negotiations, Hemeyer changed his mind again and increased the price to nearly $1 million. The concrete company balked at this ridiculous
ridiculous sum though, claiming that Heemeyer was simply being greedy and unreasonable. Appealing directly to the Granby Town Council, negotiations broke down completely when the city decided to approve the construction of the concrete plant on the land next to Heemeyer's muffler shop instead. Infuriated at losing the deal completely, Heemeyer appealed to the city council various times, claiming that the construction blocked access to his shop, which was proven incorrect. Instead of getting the approval appealed and a deal back on the table for himself, all Heemeyer managed to do was bring a city investigation of his property down on himself, which revealed that he had been dumping waste from an improvised septic tank directly into an irrigation ditch in lieu of paying to be hooked up to the city's sewer line. The city fined Heemeyer $2,500 for this and various other violations, and refused to hear any more appeals over the construction of the concrete plant. Heemeyer's greed, it seems, didn't pay off, and worse, it actually ended up costing him. This was the breaking point for Heemeyer, and something in his mind snapped. Rather than go on a shooting rampage though, Heemeyer had other plans, and showing incredible patience took a full year and a half to put his revenge plan into action. The city of Granby would pay, but clearly, a man of great ambition, Heemeyer made sure that his revenge would come in the most grandiose form possible. First, Heemeyer leased his business to a trash company, though he would end up selling it and the land it sat on several months before the ultimate rampage. A few years later, Heemeyer had bought a Komatsu D355A bull Bulldozer, which others in the town believed had been bought to construct an access road to his muffler shop, the same road he was now falsely claiming to be blocked by the concrete plant's construction. With the money earned by leasing his business, Heemeyer purchased large amounts of concrete and tool steel from an automotive dealer in Denver. Over the course of months and with the help of a homemade crane, Heemeyer built sheets of steel and attached them to the bulldozer, pouring concrete in between the sheets to make homemade composite armor that was in places over one foot thick. The armor covered the entire cab and engine compartment and even parts of the treads, making the bulldozer highly resistant to explosives and completely impervious to small arms fire. To maintain the integrity of the armor, Heemeyer fashioned a video camera system for navigation rather than put holes in the vehicle's armor, which could become an easily exploited weakness. The video cameras were linked to two monitors which were affixed to the vehicle's dashboard, and each camera was protected on the outside by 3-inch bulletproof plastic. The camera housings were even fitted with compressed air nozzles that could be used to blow dust away from the cameras and maintain good visuals. The ingenious system mirrored the digital navigation system of many modern armored tanks and was made completely by hand in Heemeyer's shed. Once sealed inside, Heemeyer would be safe from anything but very high caliber military weapons. Safe in his steel and concrete encased cocoon, Heemeyer would be free to rampage throughout the town as he pleased. For a year and a half, Heemeyer labored inside his garage to build his formidable killdozer and incredibly was never discovered. Heemeyer himself was shocked at the fact that nobody ever discovered his plans, not just because of the sheer amount of metal and concrete he was buying and shipping, but because on several occasions, individuals had come into his shop and seen the giant metal and concrete beast in various stages of construction. According to writings discovered later by the police, Heemeyer wrote, It's interesting to observe that I was never caught. This was a part-time project of one and a half year time period. Writing about his surprise in not being discovered, even with various individuals entering a shop and seeing the monster in construction, he said, somehow their vision was clouded. Heemeyer had found a reason for why his visitor's vision had been clouded, however. Recording in various audio tapes that God had built him for the job, he said that it was God's plan that he had not been married or had a family so that he could be in a position to carry out such an attack. He believed God would bless him to get the machine finished, drive it, and do the stuff that I have to do. He went on to say, God blessed me in advance for the task I I am about to undertake. It is my duty. God has asked me to do this. It's a cross that I'm going to carry, and I'm carrying it in God's name. Many other men and women have heard their own callings from God to feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, aid the poor. Heemeyer's grand crusade from God himself was to level the buildings of a small municipal government. On June 4, 2004, God apparently gave Heemeyer the go-ahead to start leveling the town of Granby. First, he drove the killdozer through the wall of his former muffler shop and then straight through the concrete concrete plant still in construction. Trying to stop the giant killdozer, Cody Doshev jumped into a wheel tractor scraper to try to head off the 
metal beast and stop the rampage tearing through his concrete plant, only to be fired on by Heemeyer from gun ports built into the Killdozer. Ultimately, in an epic battle between heavy machinery, Dochev's tractor scraper was no match for the overpowered beast, and the Killdozer pushed it aside and continued the demolition of the concrete plant. Next, Heemeyer turned his rage on Town Hall, driving it straight through the building and causing catastrophic damage. Next, he turned on a local newspaper office, which had run negative editorials on Heemeyer's grief and the failed bid to sell this land, plus the ensuing denials of his appeals. Trashing the newspaper's offices, he then headed for a former judge's widow's home, taking out the small house and several other homes in the process. Despite appearing like a random rampage, every single business or home targeted by Heemeyer had some connection to his fight against the zoning committee. Police tried several times to stop the rampage, but shotgun and rifle fire simply bounced off the composite armor of the Killdozer. Changing their tactics, they targeted the video cameras, hoping to force Heemeyer to end his rampage by blinding him. Yet still, their bullets were unable to penetrate the three inches of bulletproof plastic encasing each camera. For his part, Heemeyer returned fire with his semi-automatic rifle through various gun ports, but generally ignored the police's attempts to stop him. At one point, police officer Glenn Trainor rushed the Killdozer and climbed to top it, hoping to find a way into the beast and stop Heemeyer. Yet there was no way in because Heemeyer had built an exterior armored shell that completely encased the Killdozer, lowering it onto the dozer by crane back in his shop. Heemeyer knew that as soon as the armored plating was lowered into place, he would never be coming out of the machine alive. With options running out and fearful that the unstoppable Killdozer would be turned on Granby civilians, State Governor Bill Owens made preparations for the National Guard to dispatch an Apache attack helicopter to neutralize the vehicle. Armed with Hellfire missiles, Apache helicopters are the U.S. Army's premier anti-tank weapon, with a single missile easily able to penetrate the top armor of any tank in the world. Afraid that the collateral damage from a Hellfire strike would endanger more lives, though, the plans were switched for a two-man team to be dispatched with a javelin an anti-tank missile system. Fortunately for Granby, though, Heemeyer's Killdozer had suffered some damage to its radiator and was leaking coolant. Then, as the Killdozer leveled a hardware store, one of its treads fell into a small basement inside the store, effectively leaving the Killdozer stuck. Accepting his fate and knowing his rampage was at an end, Heemeyer killed himself shortly after with a single gunshot to the head. Police would go on to use explosives to try and remove the armored plating, but even after three tries with high explosives failed to make a dent in the monster, they opted instead to use an oxyacetylene cutting torch. Hours later, the authorities finally managed to penetrate the hull of the Killdozer and retrieve Heemeyer's body at 2 a.m. The Killdozer would ultimately be scrapped across several different junkyards to prevent souvenir collectors from seizing pieces of the now infamous homemade tank. Granby's rampage would last for two hours and seven minutes, cause an estimated $7 million in damage, and destroy or damage 13 buildings. Incredibly though, the only fatality would be Heemeyer. The United States and Russia, two military powerhouses, have had their fair share of arms races over the years. Although it is pretty common knowledge that the US military is superior to the Russian one, there is no doubt that both nations have impressive arsenals of weaponry. From battleships to aircraft carriers, fighter jets to attack helicopters, there is no shortage of weapon delivery systems. We thought it would be interesting to compare the US's main battle tank, the M1A2 Abrams, to Russia's main battle tank, the T90S, in this episode of the Infographic Show, A Tale of Two Tanks. Don't forget to subscribe and enable notifications so you can see more videos like this. Previously nicknamed The Beast and Whispering Death, the M1A2 Abrams is the United States' main battle tank and features some of the best trained tank crews in the world. The mission of the tank is described as providing mobile and protected firepower for superiority against heavy armor forces. Today they are manufactured by General Dynamics Land Systems Division and are expected to remain in service until 2050. They were created with an emphasis on making visual contact with the enemy first and less on maneuverability. The commander station has six periscopes which provide a full 360 degree view. Although many of the M1A2s are upgraded from older M1 models, the significant difference is in the computer core in the interior. The M1A2 Abrams features the best armor and crew protection in the world and state-of-the-art protection against internal fires. It even guards against chemical warfare agents. What sets the M1A2 and T90S apart from other tanks and makes them worthy adversaries are their impressive protective armor and defense systems. The Russian T90S is a versatile tank which has been described as a workhorse. Much like the American facsimile, these tanks are expected to stay functional for decades to come. 
They are known for their reliability, simplicity, layered defenses, and for having a light footprint, as they are significantly lighter than M1A2s. Adding to their versatility is their ability to use a snorkel for deep fording into 15 feet of water with equipment that takes around 20 minutes to deploy. Perhaps the most impressive feature of the T90S is the Stora 1 Optronic Countermeasure System, which disrupts the rangefinders of incoming anti-tank guided missiles and weapons, and warns the crew when the tank is being targeted. This uses an electro-optical jammer that jams an enemy's semi-automatic command to line-of-sight anti-tank guided weaponry. Developers believe that a tank employing Stora countermeasures when targeted decreases the chances of being hit by an actual anti-tank weapon by 5 to 1. This is a soft kill system and is best utilized in conjunction with a hard kill system such as the Arena, which is an active defense system. Arena uses a Doppler radar used to detect incoming threats, at which point a defensive rocket is fired off in order to destroy the threat of anti-tank weapons before they hit the T-90S. Both of these tanks can sustain a hit, and are known for their nearly impenetrable armor. M1A2 Abrams is protected by Chobham Composite Armor. This is a depleted uranium mesh which is around the hull and turret. The exact makeup of this mesh has been kept secret, but it's comprised of layers of ceramic composites inside steel armor, which are then mounted on top of a normal steel armor plate. This offers superior protection against anti-tank guided missiles and high explosive anti-tank ammunition. Similar to the T-90S Stora, some are equipped with countermeasure devices to detect and jam laser-guided anti-tank missiles. The Russian tank can take one on the chin as well. It features Contact 5 ERA explosive reactor armor. These are made from bricks of explosive that are sandwiched between two metal plates and the bricks rapidly shift sideways as the explosive detonates. What this does is make the penetrating force go through a large volume of armor. This offers protection against the heat-type projectiles as well as armor-piercing fin-stabilized discarding sabot. In order to determine what the two tanks can withstand, the armor must be examined against kinetic energy as expressed in millimeters of rolled homogeneous armor equivalent. The M1A2 Abrams turret can withstand 940 to 960 millimeters, its glacis can take 560 to 590 millimeters, while the lower front hull can take 580 to 650 millimeters. The T90S, on the other hand, comes in a bit under with the turret taking 750 to 920 mm, the glacis 670 to 710 mm, and the lower front hull only 240 mm. Moving on past the armor, let's continue comparing these two iron gladiators and look at the full tail of the tape. Speed The M1A2 can reach 42 mph and 25 mph off road. The T90S, on the other hand, can go slightly faster at 43.5 mph and 28 mph off road. Horsepower the Abrams has a significantly higher horsepower of 1500 compared to the Russian tank's 1000 horsepower. Weight is a major differentiating factor between these two tanks. The American MBT comes in at a whopping 68.7 tons, while the T90S is a comparatively lithe 46.5 tons. Comparing their size, the M1A2 Abrams is 32.25 feet long, 12 feet wide, and 8 feet high, while the Russian T90S is 31.25 feet long, 7.4 feet high, and 12.4 feet wide. The M1A2 has a crew of 4 people, while the T90S keeps it bare bones with a crew of only 3. Now we know these tanks can sustain impact from enemy fire, but what kind of heat are these beasts packing? Let's take a look at their weaponry. The M1A2 Abrams has a 120mm smoothbore cannon. The commander's weapon is a 12.7mm Browning M2 machine gun, and the loader has a 7.62mm M240 machine gun. There is an additional 7.62mm M240 machine gun mounted coaxially on the right hand side of the main armament. Not to be outdone, the T90S has a 125mm smoothbore cannon that fires APF-SDS and 9M119M reflex anti-tank gun missile. It also has a 7.62mm machine gun in a coaxial mount and a 12.7mm anti-aircraft machine gun which can fire 9M119M reflex. That said, it's the unglamorous aspects of these vehicles which truly sets them apart. A major weakness for the M1A2 Abrams is its fuel consumption. Although it has a jet engine which can take any fuel, it uses 300 gallons every 8 hours. While the Russian tank holds 422 gallons of fuel, it only takes T2 or TS1 kerosene, A72 benzene, or diesel fuel. Cost is another factor separating these two tanks. Most M1A2s are upgrades on previous M1 models, with an upgrade costing $8.58 million. The Russian T90S tanks are built for around $5 to $7 million, with an upgrade only costing about the quarter of a price of a new tank. The M1A2 Abrams may be able to withstand more than the T90S, but the Russians might have the advantage in creating a fleet, as it's estimated that each of their tanks overall cost only half as much as an M1. 
While the Abrams has impressive advancements in protection, the T90S has been able to improve on its old design without adding excess weight to its vehicles. It's a tank redesigned from the ground up with lessons from the Ukraine war in mind. In many ways, it makes it a tank of the future, including artificial intelligence, enhanced sensors, and the ability to defeat the same Javelin and in-law missiles that have been savaging Russia's tank fleet. It's the Abrams X, a huge evolutionary leap forward from the venerable stalwart tank design of the US Army. But it might be so revolutionary that the Army won't buy it. In 1979, the first M1 Abrams was revealed to great fanfare. It was replacing the M60, a Cold War stalwart, and meant to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Soviet tanks, who were slowly but surely gaining the upper hand. Its designers were confident the Abrams could defeat the best the Soviets could throw at it, but nobody was sure this risky redesign of traditional American tanks would really be up to the task. Then, in 1991, the Abrams got to show the world just how it would have handled itself in a winner-take-all battle for Europe. Taking on hordes of Soviet-built main battle tanks in the hands of veteran Iraqi crews, the Abrams absolutely eviscerated the competition, with the only losses being due to friendly fire. It was clear that the United States had won the tank competition. But that was 30 years ago, and now the US faces new threats. And that's why General Dynamics believes that it's time for a drastic redesign of this American classic. But the US Army isn't convinced. Current Abrams feature a 120mm main gun that can fire dattling ammunition, depleted uranium armor in combination with highly classified British Chabram armor, thermal sights, a fire computer to help the crew hit targets even at full speed on bumpy terrain, a networked capability to help it communicate with other friendly assets, and finally the Trophy Active Protection System to allow it to defeat enemy anti-tank missiles. The Abrams X builds on these strengths and then enhances them. First, it's the new gun. While it's still a 120mm cannon, the new gun spotted on a General Dynamics Technology Demonstrator is the XM360, a cannon originally developed in the early 2000s for the Army's future combat systems. This program was meant to catapult the US Army into a new era of technological domination. But after $18 billion spent on the program, it failed to produce a single working combat vehicle. However, while the FCS was an abject failure as a whole, it produced a great deal of successes and taught the Army many lessons. The XM360 cannon is one of those breakthroughs. While it and the current M256 cannon both share the same ammunition and have roughly the same firing characteristics, the XM360 is much lighter thanks to the use of titanium and composites. That might not seem like a big upgrade, but when you're talking about a gas-guzzling, fuel-hungry vehicle that weighs over 60 tons, every single pound shed means enhanced mobility, endurance, and speed. You're gonna hear this a lot in this episode, because the Abrams X is so new and top secret, details are extremely scarce. But other performance upgrades that this new cannon uses are unsurprisingly classified. However, we expect this new cannon will provide the ability to use all sorts of new data-linked ammo types, though an Abrams won't be shooting an anti-tank missile out of its barrel anytime soon, like some Russian designs. When your cannon is as lethal as an Abrams, you don't need fancy missiles to wreck targets. Weight is a big deal with modern main battle tanks, and the M1 Abrams has been putting on weight like a pro heavyweight fighter in intense training. When it first came out of development, the Abrams weighed a bulky 60 tons. However, after a slew of upgrades including new engines, depleted uranium armor and enhanced survivability packages for urban combat, the Abrams was starting to look like it had been going too hard on its heavyweight diet. Clocking in at 73.6 tons, the Army had serious concerns about how current Abrams would fare in combat today. Bridge crossings are especially concerning, as this much weight puts the Abrams out of safety limits for many civilian bridge infrastructures. It's increasingly looking like current Abrams should learn how to swim or will have to rely on engineers to build them bridges, a dicey proposition. Just ask the Russians in Ukraine. The Abrams X is purported to have dramatically cut the weight of this mighty war machine, though how and where remains classified. Returning to its roots, the Abrams X is back at its fighting weight of 60 tons without losing any of its current capabilities. Reduced weight in the cannon and the use of composites elsewhere is largely to thank for this engineering feat, but other weight-cutting measures remain to be disclosed, and probably never will be. Reduced crew might be a reason for lower weight, as the Abrams X features the first American three-crew design. The Soviets initially designed autoloaders for their tanks at the start of the Cold War, and this promised to relieve the logistical burden of an extra crew member. However, American observers noticed that the autoloaders experienced frequent breakdowns and other technical problems, thus giving America serious distaste for them. Despite the fact that many modern tanks such as the Leopard 2, Japanese Type 10, and South Korean K2 all feature autoloaders, the US Army isn't convinced that this is 
the right call. They prefer good old human autoloaders who cannot jam or experience any other mechanical or electrical malfunction. Plus, human autoloaders tend to provide for a higher rate of fire, though after loading a dozen or more heavy tank shells, the human is going to eventually get worn out. There is practical reasons for the Abrams to retain a fourth crew member though. In case of a track being thrown, the crew has to get out and perform a fix themselves. With tracks weighing hundreds of pounds, that extra pair of hands is a huge help. This also applies to regular maintenance, which a fourth person really helps with. In case the tank breaks down in hostile territory, a fourth crew member can help provide added security to the stricken tank. But the Abrams X is going European with the introduction of an auto loader. It promises to provide the same rate of fire as a human loader with increased reliability. It also has one other huge benefit. The crew has been removed from the turret and placed inside the hull itself. This is a dramatic improvement for crew survivability, as the armor in the hull is thicker and more difficult to penetrate. While in current designs, part of the crew is in the turret itself. This new Abrams features three crew hatches at the front of the tank, allowing the entire crew to exit in case of emergency and removing a fundamental weak point of current Abrams design, as the hatch is a significant weak spot in the already weaker top armor. The US Army remains skeptical, however. The turret does feature one significant upgrade over the Abrams, though, and that's the inclusion of a 30mm chain gun to replace the traditional 50 caliber machine gun operated by the commander, and the loader's M247.62 mm machine gun. Here, too, the Army is split, as this is both an upgrade and a downgrade. Built with lessons from Ukraine in mind, the XM914 30mm chain gun fires at blistering speeds and is designed to take on everything from lightly armored vehicles like the Russian BMP-3 to drones and other low-flying vehicles. This allows the tank to save its main gun ammo for thicker skin targets like enemy tanks. But it also means that there's one less machine gun protecting the tank from enemy infantry. If the Abrams X does ever make it into production, don't be surprised if the Army demands the 7.62mm machine gun be put back on the vehicle. A serious upgrade, though, that the Army can't complain about is the remote control technology that allows the 30mm chain gun to be controlled from the safety of the tank's interior. Current machine guns on the Abrams require an operator to have half their body hanging out of the tank, an obvious risk in a hectic battlefield. From the safety of the tank's thick armored hull, though, the crew can use a variety of vision modes including thermal to fire the chain gun and obliterate enemy targets. Perhaps the biggest visible change that the Abrams X brings to the table and one the Army is enticed by is the new hybrid electric diesel engine. Currently, Abrams use a gasoline engine and it's an absolute gas-guzzling monster, consuming at just over one gallon per mile traveled. The range of an M1 today is around 275 miles, meaning that America's tanks have to be closely followed by logistical support, which makes for a very tempting target. However, the Abrams X promises a 50% enhanced fuel efficiency, and the switch to diesel is seriously attractive to the Army given that the rest of its vehicle fleet also relies on diesel. This would significantly reduce logistical strain and costs, as the entire Army fleet could just share one fuel type. The new engine also comes with new battery packs that will hold a classified level of charge. General Dynamics has promised that the Abrams X will be able to operate in silent battery-powered mode while stationary. This will allow the tank to run on its full suite of sensors and sights without cranking up the engine, thus presenting an even more obvious target to the enemy's heat-seeking missiles and drones. However, a big change is hinted at the possibility that the Abrams X will have some limited mobility while in battery mode. This means that the biggest, baddest tank in the world could transform into a ninja for short amounts of time. Other than the armor, few things about the Abrams X are as classified as its new artificial intelligence technologies. General Dynamics has not released many details but says that the tank's AI suite will be able to assist crews by identifying targets for them amidst the chaos of a battlefield. Using advanced algorithms, the tank will be able to detect enemy vehicles and classify them as threats or non-threats, even the type of vehicle despite rain, snow, smoke, or thick fog. It'll then suggest ammo types in a firing solution for the commander, though it'll be the commander who makes the final call. Despite fears, the Abrams X is not going to take over the world if its AI goes rogue at least for now. As seen in the war in Ukraine, modern tanks are incredibly vulnerable to both drones and advanced anti-tank missiles, such as the Javelin and the Enlaw. That's why the Abrams X is built from the ground up with this threat in mind. Many have observed the truly apocalyptic scale of losses amongst Russian armored forces and wondered if there was any future for tanks anymore. 
However, the Abrams X active protection system will allow it to blast incoming rockets and missiles, allegedly providing the tank protection even from weapons like America's own Javelin, which has mauled Russian tanks. And if the tank does take a significant hit, American tank crews won't have to worry about competing with their Russian counterparts in the turret tossing Olympics. Russia will retain the gold medal in turret tossing for the foreseeable future, with their tanks achieving some truly Skyrim space program worthy heights. The reason so many Russian tanks are built as both tank and aircraft is because the Russians decided to have the tank's ammunition ring the entire turret. Thus, when the tank takes an even moderate hit to the turret, all of the ammo goes off and sends the turret into orbit while incinerating the crew. America likes its soldiers to be soldiers and not astronauts, so Abrams tanks have always kept the ammo in a separate compartment with the inclusion of blowout panels. The Abrams X has been spotted with what appears to be a blowout panel atop the turret, continuing the proud Western tradition of not having your tank send your entire crew into space from one RPG hit to the turret. Details might be scarce, but the Abrams X already looks to be a significant starting place for a big leap forward in American tank design. However, it faces significant challenges even just getting funded, as the Army is already displeased with some of its basic design elements like the loss of a fourth crew member. However, the biggest barrier standing in the Abrams X's way is the fact that the United States military does not currently face a serious land threat. Instead, it looks like its next war will be against China, and a Sino-American war will take place at sea and in the air. US tank crews are extremely unlikely to see any action in such a war, and thus funding priorities for a new battle tank remain incredibly low. In 1916, the battle landscape changed forever when a new armored fighting vehicle designed for frontline combat arrived. The tank with heavy firepower, strong armor, tracks, and a powerful engine provided good maneuverability. Tanks were first deployed by the British Army against the Germans in World War I. A tank was able to traverse no man's land, crossing fields of barbed wire, and crushing enemy trenches in the process. The first tanks were powered by tractor engines and had a half inch of armor. They were equipped with machine guns and cannons and could cause considerable damage to the enemy. They started out slow, but modern tanks have come a long way, with some topping 43 miles per hour. Today we'll be looking at how far tanks have come, how the technology, capability, and firepower has advanced. So strap yourself in, hold on to your hats, and welcome to this episode of the Infographic Show, the 10 most powerful tanks. At number 10, let's take a look at the K2 Black Panther. Development began in South Korea in 1995 using indigenous technology only. This tank uses composite armor of an undisclosed type and explosive reactive armor modules. It is claimed that the front armor could withstand direct hits from 120mm tank rounds fired from L55 guns. This tank has a very advanced fire control system which can spot, track, and fire automatically at visible vehicle-sized targets and even low-flying helicopters. The Black Panther is fitted with a powerful diesel engine with a top speed of 43 miles per hour, making it quite a beast. At number 9 is the M1A2 SEP. Providing significant protection against all well-known anti-tank weapons, it is the backbone of the US armed forces. This burly main battle tank uses advanced armor reinforced with depleted uranium layers. With a shorter 120mm L54 smoothbore gun to the K2 Black Panther, its firepower is slightly inferior, but it still packs a formidable punch. It carries one 120mm M256 smoothbore gun, one coaxial 7.62mm M240 machine gun, and one 12.7mm M2 machine gun. It can top 42 miles per hour. Next, at number 8, we've got the Challenger 2 Battle Tank. This is an advanced mean machine in service with the British Army and with the Royal Army of Oman. One of the strongest tanks in the world, the turret and hull are protected by second generation Chobham armor, the details of which are classified, but which is said to be more than twice as strong as steel. This British tank is armed with a very accurate 120mm rifled gun, its maximum aimed range is over 5 kilometers. currently the Challenger holds the record for longest tank to tank kill. At number 7 is the T-90, a third generation Russian battle tank that entered service in 1993. The T-90's main armament is the 2A46M 125mm smoothbore tank gun. It is capable of firing armor-piercing, fin-stabilized discarding sabot, high-explosive anti-tank and high-explosive fragmentation ammunition, as well as Reflex anti-tank guided missiles. Reflex can penetrate about 950 millimeters of steel armor and can also engage low-flying air targets such as helicopters. This is one formidable battle vehicle. We have another Russian tank at number 6 with the Armada, a new generation battle tank. 
It was first publicly revealed in 2015 and is much bigger than the T90. It is armed with a 125mm smoothbore 2A82 1M tank cannon that carries 45 rounds, of which 32 are in the autoloader. There is also a 12.7mm cord machine gun and a 7.62mm PKTM machine gun. The BBC reported in 2017 that the Armada is a highly automated tank replacing much of Russia's Soviet-era armor. Its Advanced Active Protection Systems, or APA, makes it highly efficient at destroying anti-tank missiles and so it is very hard to defeat. At number 5 is the Leopard 2A7 Plus, a next-generation main battle tank revealed in 2010. This tank leverages the technology of the Leopard 2 and has been adopted by the German army to conduct warfare in urban areas as well as traditional military missions. The Leopard 2A7 Plus main battle tank is equipped with a modular protection kit with passive modules to offer 360 degree protection to the crew from anti-tank missiles, mines, improvised explosive devices or IEDs, and rocket propelled grenade fire or RPG fire. This tank is also fitted with a mine plow for clearing mines and obstacles. At number 4 is the Merkava Mark IV, the latest version of the Merkava range of main battle tanks. The tank entered into service with the Israel Defense Forces in 2004 and is regarded as one of the best protected tanks in the world. The MK4 is armed with a 120mm MG253 smoothbore gun capable of firing high explosive anti-tank rounds as well as anti-tank guided missiles. The 7.62mm coaxial and 12.7mm swivel mounted machine guns and 60mm grenade launcher complement the firepower of the tank. The Trophy Active Protection System aboard the tank protects the crew against advanced anti-tank missiles. The tank can shift at an impressive maximum speed of 40 miles per hour. We have a Japanese tank at number 3 with the Type 10 TKX. The Type 10 is an advanced 4th generation main battle tank built by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries for the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force. It went into service in 2012 and claims outstanding mobility. The Type 10 comes with a 120mm smoothbore gun, a 12.7mm heavy machine gun, and Type 74 7.62mm cannon. The tank's hull is attached with modular ceramic composite armor offering protection against RPG rounds, heat projectiles, and anti-tank missiles. At number 2 we have the Leclerc, one of the best main battle tanks in the world. It is in service in France, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. It is protected with an advanced modular armor system, and its armor is a combination of steel, ceramics, and Kevlar. The Leclerc is armed with a 120mm smoothbore gun, 52 caliber long, fitted with a bustle-mounted autoloader, holding 22 rounds. The remaining 18 rounds are stored in a carousel-type storage area in front of the hull. It is claimed that Leclerc can engage 6 targets, located 1.5 to 2 kilometers away, in 1 minute, with a hit probability of 95%. That's some awesome striking capability. And finally at number 1 is the Type 99 or ZTZ-99, a third generation main battle tank built by China Northern Industries Group Corporation for the Chinese People's Liberation Army. It has a fully stabilized 125mm smoothbore gun equipped with auto loader which provides superior firepower. The tank is also marked with a 12.7mm anti-aircraft gun and a 7.62mm coaxial machine gun. The tank features a steel armored hull, and the front portion and turret are covered with explosive reactive material. And it's up there with the fastest. It has a turbocharged 1500 horsepower diesel engine providing a maximum on-road speed of 50 miles per hour. When we did our research for today's episode, we were amazed at just how many tanks are out there. A Russian tank clanks down a dirt road. Ukrainian soldiers received intel that the enemy would use this route to reach their next objective. The Ukrainian soldiers wait to spring their ambush while they laugh as they see an obsolete Soviet-era tank appear over the crest of a hill. Since the war began, Ukrainian forces have destroyed or captured hundreds of Russia's best tanks. These ancient machines have been brought out of mothball storage to fill out the ranks of Russia's armored forces after the devastating losses it saw in the first few months of fighting. How did Russia find itself in such a predicament, and where have all its tanks gone? In our scenario, the Ukrainian strike force sights the tank using their FGM-148 Javelin. At that very moment, the tank comes to a stop. The turret begins to swivel, facing directly at the Ukrainian strike force. They've been spotted. The commander shouts the order to fire. The Javelin's missile launches into the sky. There's a loud click as the T-62 tries to fire, but the shell jams in the barrel. Time and neglect have rendered the tank almost entirely useless. A few seconds later, the Javelin falls from the heavens and detonates on top of the Russian tank. Another piece of armor bites the dust. 
as the Ukrainian soldiers pack up their gear and head to the next target. There are very practical reasons why Russia has run out of modern tanks and has been forced to use their Cold War stockpiles to pad their army. We'll talk about all of them as this show progresses. This type of scenario has played out across the Ukrainian battlefield since the invasion of the country began back in February 2022. Putin really believed that Russia could just roll across the border and claim Ukraine as its own, but this is not what happened. At the beginning of the conflict, Russia boasted it had over 2,800 tanks. Yet now we're seeing old armored vehicles being brought out of storage to replenish the Russian battalions. Hundreds of Soviet-era tanks have been loaded onto rail cars and carried to the front lines. When Russia invaded Ukraine, the main tanks being used were the T-72s, which were already decades old. Newer tanks have also been deployed, but in nowhere near the same numbers as the T-72. Before the war began, military advisors warned Putin that if the full might of the Russian military wasn't deployed in the initial invasion, they might run into trouble later on. And this is exactly what happened. The hit-and-run tactics the Ukrainian forces engaged in allowed them to not only destroy Russian tanks, but capture them and repurpose the vehicles for their own use. And as we quickly approach a year since the conflict began, it's becoming more and more clear just how much trouble Russia is in. The fact was made abundantly clear when a video surfaced of the precursor to the T-72 being taken out of storage and deployed to the front lines. The tank that is now making an appearance in the war is the T-62, which is all but obsolete. This choice of an ancient tank is surprising, as Russia has somewhere around 10,000 tanks in storage, many of which are newer than T-62s. So why is Russia bringing one of its oldest tanks out of retirement? The answer to this question is so embarrassing even Putin must know how dumb he looks. The Russians have hundreds and even thousands of T-64s, T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s, all of which are newer than the T-62s. But that's the problem. The tanks have been neglected for so long that the newer models, which have more sophisticated components, need massive amounts of repairs. However, T-62s were built using Soviet-era technology and have fewer electronics and moving parts. The simplicity of the T-62 has allowed some of them to last for decades without needing the maintenance that modern tanks require. Many of the more sophisticated tanks that came after the 62s are believed to be beyond repair. Another factor the T-62s have going for them is that Russia has a huge number of them in storage. The sheer number of these tanks constructed during the height of the Cold War likely means that at least a few were found without too much corrosion or rust damage. Even more unfortunate for Russia is the fact that their most advanced tank to date, the T-14 Armada, has not even begun rolling off the assembly line in any meaningful numbers yet. Several years ago, Russia planned on purchasing thousands of these tanks to serve as their main armored force in future conflicts. However, production never began. Putin ordered more tanks to be built, but it's too late. Harsh sanctions and a lack of resources have brought the T-14 production to a standstill. The fact that Russia is now deploying tanks that were starting to be retired in 1975 does not bode well for their war effort. There are several reasons that Vladimir Putin and his army are now scrambling to find ways to replenish their armored division. Much of it has to do with Ukrainian doctrine and their refusal to give up their country. But Russia itself has made some huge mistakes, which they're now paying for dearly. Things are even worse than they appear for Russia as they begin pulling old tanks out of deep storage. When tanks like the T-62 were retired, they were put in huge warehouses or parked outside where the elements quickly began to corrode them. Even the tanks that were sealed away in large structures were never taken care of. This means that pickings are slim as the Russian military scours the thousands of decommissioned tanks for ones that'll work well enough to send to the front lines. Russia is currently facing a tank crisis as they put more retired tanks on the front lines. However, it's only a matter of time before this leads to a catastrophe as they'll eventually run out of working tanks altogether. It's theorized that the Soviet-era tanks are being deployed just long enough for new tanks to roll off assembly lines. But as we know, these new tanks may never come. This has led to a real crisis for the Russian military. It's pulled back and dug in along the territory it already controls in the Donbass region, so the troop numbers, supplies, and armor can be replenished. It's estimated that Ukrainian forces have destroyed at least four Russian tanks a day since the conflict began. Obviously, on days when there is intense fighting, more tanks are lost than when there's a lull. However, recent estimates suggest the Russian military has lost over 8,400 vehicles and pieces of equipment since the conflict began. This includes around 1,500 tanks, which have either been completely destroyed or captured by the Ukrainian forces. At this point, Russian military officials must be incredibly embarrassed and afraid for their lives. Putin does not take too kindly to failure, and these numbers suggest the invasion has been a huge failure thus far. As Russia starts replenishing its battalions with obsolete tanks, 
The numbers of losses will only increase for Russia. Less advanced tanks make easier targets, which means the Ukrainian military can keep using the same tactics, while simultaneously taking out even more of Russia's armored divisions. What makes Ukrainian troops so effective against Russian tanks? Some of the reasons are pretty obvious, while others are almost unbelievable. A big part of the Ukrainian military's success has to do with the quality of their weapons. Ukraine is by no means fully stocked with the weapons and gear they need. They are constantly pleading with NATO to send them more military aid, including anti-tank weapons. As the next phase of the war begins, Ukraine will need to prepare for another Russian push forward. And as things stand now, it looks like Russia will launch another attack using tanks and artillery after they bombard major cities and Ukraine's infrastructure with missiles and kamikaze drones. Thus far, Ukraine has made do with what it has. One of the weapons that have been effective in reducing the number of Russian tanks on the battlefield is the US-made FGM-148 Javelin. Since the war began, the United States has supplied Ukrainian forces with over 4,000 Javelins, with more said to be shipped into the country in the coming months. What makes these weapons so effective against any type of tank is the way the missile is deployed. A single Ukrainian soldier can fire a Javelin and destroy a tank. That's pretty staggering as without this weapon it could take a whole unit and some heavy artillery to stop a Russian tank from rolling across the battlefield. The Javelin's missile launches an arc that allows it to strike at the top of the tank where the armor is the weakest. This means that every time a Javelin is fired in Ukraine, there's a good chance it'll either immobilize or severely damage the Russian tank. Even the most advanced tanks that have reactive armor to absorb a missile's impact don't stand a chance against the Javelin. This is because the missiles are fitted with two warheads. The first detonates to damage the disruptive armor, so when the second warhead goes off, all of its power goes into the chassis of the tank. This one-two punch is devastating for any armored vehicle struck by the missile, which is one of the main reasons Russian tanks are not faring so well against Ukrainian troops. Britain is also sending the next-generation light anti-tank weapons to Ukraine to supplement the javelins that the United States has shipped. The thousands of anti-tank weapons that have already been distributed to Ukrainian troops have allowed them to put a sizable dent in the number of tanks Putin is able to field. Unfortunately for Russia, the British in-laws and the US Javelins will be even more effective against their outdated Soviet-era tanks currently being sent to replenish their dwindling armored divisions on the front lines. The United States also plans to send a contingent of switchblade anti-tank drones to Ukraine in the near future. These kamikaze drones will target Russian tanks and reduce their numbers even further. The Russians have been using HESA Shahed-136 drones made by the Iranian company Shahed Aviation Industries to target Ukrainian infrastructure, so it'll be interesting to see how they like it when their tanks are continuously blown up by the same technology they've used to strike against Ukrainian infrastructure. Ukrainian troops, high-tech anti-tank weapons, and well-executed missions are the main reasons why Russia is running out of tanks. Ukrainian soldiers are destroying them faster than Russia can make them, which is not what Putin expected. However, there are a few other factors that are leading the rapid decline in Russian tank numbers, and the only one Russia can blame for this is themselves. Russia's tactics when using tanks are a mess. The most common makeup for a Russian unit is known as a battalion tactical group. This consists of a company of tanks, infantry, and artillery, which doesn't seem like a bad combination at first, but Russia has really messed up the numbers of each within the unit. More often than not, these battalions are made up of mostly armored vehicles and tanks, with a small contingent of troops tacked on for protection. Battalion tactical groups are really good at moving quickly, packing a punch and hitting a target hard. However, if they come under attack, they're highly vulnerable. Ukrainian forces have exploited this flaw in the Russian battle plan by waiting for a battalion tactical group to pass by and ambushing them. Using javelins or other anti-tank measures is relatively easy against these Russian units because there are no troops to support the armor. Ukrainian infantry can hide within densely structured areas where the tanks can't maneuver well, which gives them the upper hand. If Russian commanders included more infantry in the battalion tactical groups, these exposed tanks might have a chance against Ukraine's guerrilla tactics. This would be highly beneficial for tanks operating in urban areas or locations where the terrain limits maneuverability. However, Russia still hasn't modified its tactics to take these things into consideration. Therefore, Ukrainian troops continue to incapacitate or destroy Russian tanks that don't have the support they need to successfully fight the types of battles being waged in Ukraine. Along with having battalions without proper support, Russian tactics have another fatal flaw. Before sending tanks into battle, it's important to survey the area using drones or aircraft. However, Russia doesn't seem to be doing this, which has allowed Ukrainian troops to get into striking positions along the routes Russian tanks are using. 
Ukraine has kept Russia from claiming complete air superiority in the region, which has definitely helped its tank-destroying efforts. Their units take out several tanks at a time and then fall back to prepare for the next fight. These hit-and-run tactics are working like a charm and causing massive losses for the Russians. However, if Russia starts conducting flyovers before moving their tanks into position, it could save a lot of armor from being lost. Recent reports by defense intelligence agencies suggest Russia's moving away from its traditional battalion tactical groups as they finally realized how ineffective they are. But it's a little too late, as the Russian army has already lost hundreds of tanks as a direct result of using BTGs. It's unclear why it took so long for Russia to leverage its numbers and make changes to its unit structure, but it likely has to do with our next point. Besides good Ukrainian tactics and poor Russian tactics, there's another even more awkward reason why Russia's running out of tanks. Incompetence Data collection conducted by independent organizations has suggested that somewhere around half the tanks Russia has lost during the war have either been abandoned or captured. Most experts believe this is due to the incompetence of Russian soldiers. To be fair, it's not entirely their fault. Many of the Russians fighting in Ukraine were just conscripted before the invasion and don't have any battle experience. This factor, on top of very little training, is a recipe for disaster. This has led to entire tank crews abandoning their vehicles and running for their lives. The craziest part is that abandoned tanks are not always the result of Ukrainian ambushes or even fighting breaking out. Some of the Russian tanks that Ukraine recovered were deserted because they had run out of fuel. Think about that for a moment. A war machine worth millions of dollars left for the enemy to capture because it ran out of gas. That brings wartime incompetence to a whole new level. It's almost as if Russian soldiers don't care if they win the war or not, which might be closer to the truth than Putin or anyone in his government wants to admit. Last spring, tanks got stuck in the mud as the snow melted. Regardless of the risks, the Russian high command ordered the tank battalions to push forward in these conditions. The results were inevitable. Many tanks became bogged down to the point they couldn't be pulled out of the muck and were abandoned. So it appears the incompetency of the Russian military runs all the way through the ranks. It's these unbelievably dumb decisions that have led to hundreds of tanks being captured by Ukraine. And once the ground hardens and the gas tanks are filled up again, these war machines can be used by Ukrainian forces to fight the very country that built them. But it's not just low fuel and bad decisions that have led to dwindling tank numbers. Since many of the Russian soldiers did not receive the proper training they should have, tanks have been driven into ditches, resulting in their tracks coming off. However, rather than fixing the problem and making sure the tank doesn't fall into enemy hands, Russian soldiers have just left them behind. It's quickly becoming apparent the loss of tanks is as much the fault of the Russians as it is of the Ukrainian forces. Perhaps the most absurd thing of all is that Russian tanks have been even seen driving off bridges when their operators lost control of the vehicle. In this particular situation, the tanks can rarely be salvaged. But abandoned Russian equipment has become so common during the war that the Ukrainian government even issued a national instruction on what citizens should do if they come across abandoned Russian vehicles or gear. The government was also nice enough to inform their people that any Russian equipment they confiscate does not need to be declared on their taxes, which is absolutely wild. The way the Russian military handles their tanks seems more like something out of a wartime comedy than an actual war. However, the continued invasion of Ukraine is no laughing matter. As the winter months continue, Ukraine desperately needs more weapons to fight against this next wave of Russian attacks. Currently, Russian forces have pulled back to lick their wounds and replenish their numbers. After months of fighting, more than 100,000 Russian soldiers have been killed or injured. The Ukrainian people have been battling bravely, but if they do not receive the support they need, Russia will eventually be able to throw enough men and outdated weapons at them to cause greater destruction and loss. Right now, we know the Russian tank numbers are so low that they're bringing Soviet-era tanks out of retirement. These models might be obsolete, but at this point Russia doesn't have a choice. More tanks are being built and will hit the front lines when they're completed, which is why it's vital that Ukrainian forces have weapons to defend against them. Right now, most of the damage being done to Ukrainian infrastructure is by missiles and drones striking power stations and factories. This has left much of the population without any energy or heat. The brutal war that Russia has started will not end as long as Vladimir Putin is in power. And since the psychopathic dictator has a stranglehold on the country and the people in it, the war will likely continue into the coming months regardless if Russia's tank numbers continue to decline. The scary thing is, is if Russia finds itself running low on tanks and other conventional weapons, what will they decide to do next? If Putin can't replenish his battalions with new or even old tanks, will he consider launching tactical nukes? This is a terrifying thought, but Vladimir Putin is a terrifying man, as he could start a nuclear war at any moment in time.
For right now, Ukrainian troops appear to be able to deal with Russia's tanks and are even in control of many of them. Ukrainian tactics and Russian incompetence are the main reason why Russia is currently running out of armored vehicles and scrambling to bring outdated tanks out of storage. When the winter ends and the ground begins to thaw from the spring sunshine, it'll be interesting to see how many Soviet-era tanks are left stuck in the mud for Ukrainians to find. A Nazi soldier opens the hatch to his panzer tank. He scans the horizon for enemy Soviet forces. Suddenly, a single soldier pops out from behind a kitchen tent. He holds a rifle in one hand and an axe in the other. The Soviet has a crazed look in his eyes as he runs toward the Nazi tank, screaming at the top of his lungs. He swings his axe back and forth, ready to decapitate anyone who gets in his way. Shocked, the Nazi soldier slams the hatch shut and peers through the viewport. The Soviet soldier leaps into the air and lands on the tank. The man who would later take down this and other Nazi tanks using his axe and deception was Ivan Pavlovich Sereda. The craziest part was that he was only a cook. That's right, this Soviet war hero who would go on to destroy tanks and successfully fight off countless Nazi soldiers during World War II started out as a cook in the Red Army. Ivan was drafted into the 91st Tank Regiment in 1939, just after Nazi Germany launched their invasion into Poland and started World War II. At the time, Germany and the Soviet Union had a non-aggression pact, but Stalin and the rest of the Soviet leaders did not trust Adolf Hitler to keep his word. This would turn out to be a smart decision. The Soviet Union started amassing tanks and troops along their western border just in case Hitler decided to break his pact. Ivan Pavlovich Sereda wanted to serve his country and asked his superior officers to transfer him to the front lines. They looked at him and thought for a moment, and then his CO shook his head. He told Ivan that anyone could shoot a gun, but not everyone could cook as well as him. His talents were needed in the kitchen to keep the troops fed, which was just as important as being stationed at the border. Ivan disagreed but followed his orders. Then in February 1941, Nazi Germany started amassing troops along the Romanian-Soviet border near where Ivan and his tank platoon were stationed. The Soviets had been keeping close tabs on the war in Europe. Hitler and his Axis powers seemed to be decimating the continent. However, Great Britain was still a thorn in the side, and the Soviets didn't think Hitler would be bold enough to launch an offensive on a second front. But he was a psychopath, so anything was possible. Ivan's regiment was repositioned and stationed in the small forest near Dvinsk which is now Pils in current-day Latvia. For several months, there was no action. It just seemed like both sides were at a standoff, and Hitler might actually keep his non-aggression pact. But then on June 22, 1941, Ivan and his regiment heard a crackling voice come over the radios. The Soviet communications network was not very reliable, and it was difficult to make out exactly what was being said. But between the static, the words everyone was dreading were heard. The Nazis had launched an invasion into the Soviet Union. The attack was called Operation Barbarossa and consisted of over 3 million soldiers and approximately 3,000 tanks, 7,000 pieces of artillery, and 2,500 aircraft. Ivan was only a cook, but he couldn't help but feel a sense of duty. He wanted nothing more than to be promoted so he could fight on the front lines, but it was not to be for the moment. The Nazis began bombing cities along the border as they pushed through the Red Army. Their forces decimated Soviet resistance and advanced further and further into the motherland. Ivan in the 91st Tank Regiment had seen little action, but in August 1941 that was about to change. Word had reached them that the Germans were moving closer to their position. The tank battalion was sent out on a scouting mission to see if they could intercept the incoming Nazis. Ivan was left all alone at the camp to prepare dinner for later that evening. Ivan was cutting up potatoes and other vegetables to put into a hot stew that would keep his comrades warm and their bellies full. It was a quiet afternoon. The wind blew gently across the field where Ivan whistled to himself as he cooked. As he took a break from stirring and stepped out of the tent that served as the kitchen, he heard the sounds of engines in the distance. He thought that his regiment must be returning from patrolling the area, so he continued to cook. The sound of the tank started getting closer and closer. The pots and pans in the kitchen began to clang against one another as the ground shook from the approaching tanks. They didn't seem to be slowing, which made Ivan nervous. The area where the supplies were kept and the tanks were parked was a decent way away from the kitchen, but these tanks seemed to be rolling right up to the tent. Ivan poked his head out to see what was happening. From where he was, he couldn't see over the embankment on the other side of the road. He stepped out from inside the tent and walked toward the road. He slowly climbed up the small hill and peered over the side. What he saw was startling. Two German tanks from the 8th German Tank Division were heading toward him. He ducked back down behind the ridge and paused for a moment. He could hear the tanks continuing straight toward him. Ivan had wanted so badly to be on the front lines and now he was. The only problem was he was all alone and he was up against a heavily armored Panzer 38T. In an ideal situation, he would be with a platoon of men or at least in his own tank, but that was not what fate had in store for him. 
As he peered back down over the embankment, he saw one of the tanks peel away and head in a different direction. However, the other panzer was still moving straight toward him. Ivan slid down the hill and ran behind his cooking tent. Just as he disappeared from sight, the Nazi tank crested the hill and approached the road. The roar of the engines began to slow as the tank came to a stop. The hatch of the German Panzer 38T creaked open, and the Nazi soldier stuck his head out. He scanned the area for any Soviets, as this appeared to be their encampment, but he didn't see anyone. Ivan was panting behind the tent. He closed his eyes and slowed his breathing. The air was cold. His breath rose like steam coming off a hot pot. Ivan looked to his left and saw his rifle leaning against a crate. He grabbed the rifle and a grenade resting on top of the box. Ivan knew that the Germans would roll over him if he didn't do something quickly. Or even worse, they could lie in wait for his comrades to return and launch a surprise attack. Ivan decided that he would need to take out the tank himself. He moved around to the side of the tent. His foot bumped into something resting on the ground. He looked down to see an axe impaled on a log that he was chopping. Ivan looked at the axe for a moment and then smiled. He had an idea. Ivan picked up the axe, peered out from behind the tent, and prepared to do something crazy. When the Nazi looked the other way, Ivan ran toward the tank, screaming like a madman. He fired his rifle with one hand while swinging the axe wildly with the other. This surprised the Nazi, who quickly retreated back into the tank and shut the hatch. He screamed to the tank crew that they were under attack. The machine gunner swiveled the 7.92mm ZB-53 machine gun toward the crazed Soviet running at the tank. He pulled the trigger. Bullets started whizzing by Ivan's head. They ripped through the tent behind him, but Ivan managed to dodge back and forth to stay out of the direct line of fire. Miraculously, he made it to the side of the tank without being hit by a single bullet. Ivan launched himself off the ground and scrambled up onto the panzer's hull. He moved toward the front of the vehicle and brought his axe down on the machine gun. He hit the barrel of the gun over and over again until it bent and jammed. Ivan had disabled the tank's close-range weapon, and now he needed to deal with the crew inside the metal behemoth. The Nazis began to yell. The tank's engines roared to life. It started to move with Ivan on top of it. He looked around for some way to stop the Nazis from getting away. He used his axe to cut off a piece of tarp that was holding down supplies on the hull of the tank. Ivan grabbed the tarp and stuck it over the viewport so the crew inside couldn't see where they were going. The tank began to swivel back and forth. Now Ivan had to think of a way to get the Nazis to come out of the tank. He began shouting at the top of his lungs for his comrades to start setting grenades under the tank in order to blow it up. This was a bluff as there were no other Soviet soldiers around, but the Germans didn't know that. Ivan continued to shout orders and bang on the hull of the tank with his axe. This confused the Nazis inside, who now thought there was a whole platoon of angry Soviet soldiers outside the vehicle. Ivan continued to shout at the Germans to give up or their tank would be blown up with him inside it. He even used different voices to make it seem as if there were more people than just him banging on the tank. The Nazis tried desperately to escape, but since they couldn't see, they had no idea there was only one man outside their tank holding them hostage. After several minutes of this charade, the Nazis shouted from within the bowels of the tank that they wanted to surrender. Ivan smiled to himself as he agreed to their surrender and told them to come out one at a time. The first Nazi crew member turned the locking mechanism on the tank's hatch and exited the armored vehicle. He was greeted by Ivan holding up his rifle and instructing the German soldier to line up along the tank. The rest of the tank crew followed. Ivan had captured four Nazis and a Panzerkampfwagen 38T tank single-handedly. When the Germans realized they'd been duped, they were likely extremely ashamed, and at that point they didn't even know that Ivan was only a cook. That evening, the rest of the tank regiment returned to camp. They found a Nazi tank with its crew tied up waiting for them. The Soviet soldiers got out of their vehicles and looked in astonishment as their cook, Ivan Pavlovich Sereta, exited the kitchen with hot food in his hands. His superior officers asked him what happened and Ivan gladly recounted the events of the day to them. The Soviets examined the vehicle, interrogated the Nazis, and found that Ivan was telling the truth. He really had captured the Nazi tank using nothing but his rifle and an axe. That night, as all the Soviets ate the meal that Ivan had prepared, they listened to his daring story of how he'd managed to trick the Germans and take them all prisoner. They were all astonished at his tale. His commanding officers immediately took him off the kitchen duty and promoted him to scout. He'd finally gotten what he wanted. Ivan was sent on missions to scout Nazi positions in the area and bring information back. The story of how he used his axe to destroy a machine gun on a German tank and then capture the crew spread like wildfire across the Soviet Union. It was used in propaganda posters to bolster the morale of troops. Ivan was now a war hero, but he didn't let it go to his head. Only a few weeks after taking out the Nazi panzer with his axe and becoming a scout, Ivan captured another tank and demolished a unit of Nazi soldiers. This time, he was better equipped, but what he did was no less miraculous than his first battle with a tank. Ivan and a group of scouts were conducting reconnaissance on an area that was reported to have German soldiers patrolling it. As they made their way through the forest, the birds were singing, and the sun warmed the air. 
They reached the tree line and sighted a group of Soviet soldiers running down a dirt road. Ivan was going to make his presence known when suddenly a Nazi tank broke through the trees. The tank fired its cannon at the retreating Soviets, causing the trunks of the trees to explode into shards of splintered wood. The debris went flying everywhere as the machine gun aboard the German tank opened fire. The bullet slammed into the ground all around the retreating Soviet force. As the tank laid down covering fire, a group of Nazi foot soldiers appeared from behind the armored vehicle. They started to pursue the Soviets down the road while the tank followed. The Nazis shouted at the Soviets to halt, however, if they were caught, they'd be tortured for information, so rather than surrender, the Soviets dove behind fallen logs and returned fire. But the support of the tank was too much, and the members of the Red Army appeared to be doomed. Ivan fell back to the tree line and stealthily worked his way behind the tank. The Soviets fired at the tank, but the armor was too thick, and the bullets bounced off harmlessly. The Nazis continued to advance forward. While the tank and Nazi soldiers were focused on the trapped Soviets, Ivan climbed up the back of the vehicle. He carefully stepped over the gear strapped to the tank's hull and made sure his footsteps made as little noise as possible. Since the machine gunner was firing at his comrades, they couldn't hear Ivan scurry across the top of the tank and unlock the commander's hatch. Ivan armed a grenade, opened the hatch, and peered down into the opening for a moment. He locked eyes with the Nazi commander sitting in the middle of the tank. The German yelled to warn the others, but it was too late. Ivan dropped the grenade into the tank, slammed the hatch shut, and jumped off the moving vehicle. The grenade detonated, killing everyone inside. He'd done it again. Ivan had single-handedly captured another tank. Without missing a beat, Ivan jumped back on the tank and ran to the hatch. Even though he'd killed the tank crew, the Nazi soldiers were still advancing on his comrades. Ivan threw the hatch open and climbed into the smoldering inside of the tank. The bodies of the crew were covered in shrapnel and blood. Ivan moved the gunner's body out of the seat and took position. He turned the turret and aimed directly at the advancing German force. Taking a deep breath, Ivan peered through the sighting tube and made sure everything was lined up. He squeezed the trigger. The tank buckled as the shell was ejected from the barrel. It flew through the air and slammed into the middle of the Nazi unit. The detonation threw bodies everywhere. Around a dozen of the German soldiers were instantly killed or seriously injured. The rest laid down their guns and immediately surrendered. They were now sandwiched between their own tank, which was controlled by the former cook turned war hero and a squad of angry Soviet soldiers. Confused as to what was going on, the Soviet troops cautiously approached the Nazi tank. Its barrel was still smoking. They asked whoever was inside to come out slowly. Ivan popped the hatch and poked his head through the hole with a smile on his face. The entire unit let out a cheer. When Ivan returned to base after his impromptu rescue mission, he was greeted with even more accolades. On August 31, 1941, he received the Presidium of the USSR for exemplary performance of combat tasks of the command on the front of the fight against the German invaders and showing courage and heroism. He also received the title of Hero of the USSR, the Order of Lenin, and the Gold Star Medal. He would soon be transferred to another unit, but one of his former comrades said that the 91st Tank Regiment kept his axe as a battle relic and a reminder of Ivan Pavlovich Sereda's heroism. There was no time for Ivan to celebrate his awards, however, as the worst fighting of the war was yet to come. Ivan was made platoon leader of the 4th Infantry Regiment and gained command of the 46th Infantry Division of the 1st Shock Army. He saw some combat during this time, but it was when he was promoted to company commander of the 7th Infantry Regiment that things got really intense. This unit was sent to Leningrad during the siege of the city, which would become one of the bloodiest and most brutal blockades the world had ever seen. In fact, many historians believe that the siege of Leningrad was actually a form of genocide because of the Nazis' systemic starvation and murder of civilians who were stuck in the city. Things got so bad during the siege that there are accounts of Soviet civilians cutting off their own flesh and eating it for sustenance. The siege began on September 8, 1941, when the Nazis secured the last road into or out of the city and didn't end until January 27, 1944, 872 days from when the blockade started. It was at this point that the Red Army was able to overcome Nazi forces and push them back toward Germany. Ivan joined the fight to hold Leningrad at the beginning of the siege as it was pummeled by Nazi artillery. He would not stay for the duration of the battle, as his skills were required in Moscow only a few months after the siege of Leningrad had begun. While in Leningrad, Ivan was likely deployed for reconnaissance and saboteur missions. With his ability to take out tanks in unconventional ways, he might have been ordered to disrupt enemy artillery encampments and try to break the siege. During these missions, Ivan and his unit would use forests surrounding the city of Leningrad to hide from German forces. Using the cover of night, they could place bombs near ammunition stores and do their best to hinder enemy operations. We don't know the exact role that Ivan played in the defense of Leningrad, but it may have been just as crazy as his other two major run-ins with the Nazis. After a few months of fighting at Leningrad, Ivan was made the company commander of the 185th Infantry Division of the 30th Army and sent to the Battle of Moscow. 
On November 27, 1941, Ivan and his unit met up with other Soviet forces near the city. The brutally cold temperatures of the Soviet winter were quickly approaching. Although the Red Army didn't have the supplies and equipment they needed, all of the soldiers, including Ivan, had survived decades of winters in their country. It would not be enjoyable, but the Soviets knew how to handle the brutal weather. The Nazis, on the other hand, were worn down from months of battling Soviet forces to get to Moscow. Ivan and his men were set up along the outskirts of the city to stop the advancing German forces. They would send tank regiments to try to break through the Soviet defenses, but units like Ivan's had laid down mines and set up kill zones where they would ambush any Nazi forces that came through. With each day that went by, the weather got colder and colder. The Germans were beginning to freeze to death. Although Ivan was now in charge of his own company, he may have also helped out in the kitchens where his career in the military had begun. He carried his axe with him, as it was a valuable tool not just for defeating Nazi tanks but also for chopping wood to keep his soldiers warm. By December, Ivan and the rest of the Soviet forces had held off wave after wave of Nazi advancement toward Moscow. The Germans could not break the line. Their army was starving and freezing to death when on December 5, 1941, the Soviets launched a counteroffensive that would push the enemy away from Moscow and back to Germany. By January, the Nazis could no longer fight back. Temperatures were recorded as low as negative 42 degrees Celsius or negative 44 Fahrenheit. The German Luftwaffe couldn't fly their planes as their wings and propellers were frozen in place. Ivan and the Soviet forces at Moscow pushed forward and destroyed any German force that was unable to escape the harsh landscape and climate of the Soviet Union. But the weather and continuous fighting also took their toll on the Red Army, and a stalemate developed. Ivan continued to fight the Nazi invaders for the duration of the war. His expertise and heroism allowed him to move up in the ranks of the Red Army. Ivan was a lieutenant when the war came to an end in 1945. He retired but still had a desire to serve the people of the Soviet Union. He became chairman of his village council to help rebuild after the devastation of World War II. Unfortunately, the toll of war does not end when the fighting stops. Due to breathing in harmful fumes from tanks, spending countless nights in below freezing weather, and harmful chemicals that were ingested while fighting the Nazis, Ivan's health began to decline rapidly in 1950. He passed away at the age of 31. From the time he could join the military to the day he died, Ivan Pavlovich Sereda served his country and gave his life to the Soviet Union. He died a highly decorated war hero and remains the only known chef to take out a tank using an axe. It's the beginning of October 2022. A young American man is doing something spectacularly unusual. He is actually reading a newspaper. So what does he learn from this mysterious object of yore? Well, it's Jimmy Carter's 98th birthday. The US and Venezuela just did a prisoner swap, and it's the five-year anniversary of the deadliest mass shooting in US modern history. But the story that gets his attention is headlined, Ukraine has been turned into a giant scrap heap of Russian tanks. What's going on? What's been going on? That's what we'll find out today. It's true, if you went to certain areas of Ukraine right now, you'd find what look like graveyards for Russian tanks. The tanks, usually looking like they're well past their prime, are everywhere. You can see photos of them in the background as Ukrainians go about their normal day. Take for example the town of Izium in the Kharkiv Oblast province in eastern Ukraine. This place used to look majestic. These days, if you walk through parts of Izium, the word that would spring to mind is apocalypse. It was liberated in September 2022, but not before five months of fighting. When the Russians were there, they spent some of their time interrogating, torturing, and killing residents. One of them, who survived, later said he was interrogated and shocked by one of those old Soviet military field telephones. Another witness said, Russians wore masks and tortured civilians with bare electric wires. Mass graves were later dug up, with the Western media saying this was now a pattern of Russian occupation. We only know this, of course, because the Russians left in a hurry. They didn't just retreat, but they left all kinds of things behind, including quite a lot of tanks, some bashed up, some just abandoned. The Washington Post wrote, Ukrainian troops have documented war machines in various states, from combat-ready tanks to vehicles in need of repair. In some cases, Ukrainian forces have obliterated Russian weapons, leaving smoldering vehicles to be discovered by the advancing forces. In one of the videos, you can actually hear a Ukrainian talking about the Russian tanks as if they were the bounty of school kids' stolen candy. One of the soldiers says, you and I get a tank, we all get a tank, each. This was just one town. If you were to visit the town of Liman in the Donbass region, you'd see something similar. You'd find tanks all over the place, some of which have been damaged, but some that were abandoned in decent shape. What a gift that is to the Ukrainians. We'll come to the value of such tanks a bit later. One media report said the aftermath of the Russian retreat was a macabre scene. 
bodies of Russian and Ukrainian soldiers were strewn all over the streets. A Ukrainian resident told the Ukrainian soldier, The smell is unbearable. Stray dogs have already eaten two of them. When are you coming to pick up these dead bodies? She might have also asked, When are you going to take all those damn tanks away? The retreat was described as embarrassing for Putin. Not only had the Russian army lost a lot of young men, but again the Russians had lost a lot of very expensive machinery too. The Guardian wrote, Video showed burned out vehicles, personal belongings, and dead soldiers strewn across a forest road. Ukrainian forces recovered at least one T-72 tank, which had suffered minor damage. Carnage everywhere, dead people lying in the streets, families found dead in their cars, and a great big pile-up of heavy-duty military weapons. You can read a news story similar to this relating to a number of places. Earlier in the year, news reports suggested that Russia was losing about five tanks daily. Then things got much worse for Russia when Ukraine began its counteroffensives in the east later in the year. The number of tank losses was then reported to be in the region of 10 tanks a day. These were T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s. Some of the T-62s that were destroyed or captured date back to the 70s, possibly even the 60s. Sure, the Ukrainians have lost a good number of their own tanks, but not anywhere near as many as the Russians, according to various sources in the Western media. The Russian media, of course, might put a different spin on things. No doubt both sides don't mind tweaking the numbers, that's war. But these tanks are proof that Russia has done extremely badly in the tank department. Ten tanks a day adds up to a lot. In October, Forbes wrote that total tank losses for Russia stood at 1,392, with 801 of them destroyed and the others still being repairable. We found a report from a Ukrainian source that said the Russian tank losses were more like 2,573 although that story was published two weeks later. Other reports stated that some of the abandoned tanks were in tip-top condition and still of service because Ukrainian ammo could be used with them. Some were burned and busted with Russian soldiers still inside them, usually three of them. Six percent of all Russian casualties in the war have been tank crews, according to one analyst. It must be a horrible way to die, being burned alive in a metal box. But it seems it's not out of the realm of possibility for a Russian soldier. Bear that in mind as we go on with the show. According to the website Global Firepower, Russia has a stock of 12,420 tanks and 30,122 armored vehicles. These numbers are for 2022, although we aren't sure if Global Firepower keeps updating the website since there are daily losses. Still, about 10,000 of the Russian tanks are in storage. For the ones being used, as you know, some are old, but some of them are modern iterations of the very able T-90. Now, we must ask why so many Russian tanks are decorating parts of Ukraine. If you were to ask an analyst, they might tell you it's complicated. They'll tell you that it's more than Russian tanks being obsolete in the battlefield. Let us explain. According to experts watching the war unfold, Russia has lost 237 T-72 B-3 tanks and hundreds more other iterations of T-72s that date back decades. The country has lost in the region of 170 T-80s, which were around the 1970s and were last built in 2001. So, yes, we have some pretty old tanks there. But there is more to the losses than many of the tanks perhaps not being modern enough for battle. The truth is, Russia has been using these tanks when they weren't needed, or they deployed them clumsily. A military analyst based in the UK explained, Tanks are supposed to fight as part of combined formations, but in terms of how they've been tactically used, Russia hasn't done that effectively. You see, tanks should be usually arriving on the battlefront when there is infantry and artillery close by to support them. Otherwise, close-range anti-tank missiles will take the tanks out easily. The best-case scenario for Russian tank crews? The Ukrainian anti-tank weapons and the people firing them would be destroyed or at least repulsed. This hasn't been happening anywhere near as often as Russian tank crews would like. We should also look at the billions of dollars the US and other countries are sending to Ukraine. A lot of the military aid consists of weapons that can easily destroy tanks, sometimes from a great distance, such as the US-guided multiple launch rocket systems. In September, the New York Times wrote that these have already helped deplete Russian tank numbers. But these are for long-distance warfare. The US also supplies some arms to Ukraine used for close-quarters combat, including various anti-tank systems. The weapons sent from the US include hundreds of Javelin anti-armor systems, each costing about $250,000. These weapons hit the tanks from above where they're the weakest. They've been working out so far for Ukraine. The media reported the U.S. has sent over to Ukraine 1,500 units of tube-launched optically-tracked wire-guided or tow anti-tank missiles. Along with those, plus the Javelins, the U.K. added a bunch of new-generation light anti-tank weapons. These short-range weapons can be easily transported on light-armored vehicles, and the U.S. has sent millions of dollars worth of those over in its $54 billion package. So in terms of weapons, Ukraine right now 
it's getting a lot of assistance. So, you have old tanks sometimes traveling without enough support, going up against some of the most formidable anti-tank weaponry there is. Is it any wonder those Russian soldiers are leaving their tanks at the side of the street and running for their lives? All they really want in life is someone to love and friends to share the odd drink with. Being incinerated is hardly their ambition. This is important. The mental aspect, that is. This isn't the 1940s. Soldiers are not like they used to be, and their commanders are not anywhere near as brutal. Sacrificing oneself for your country seems like a raw deal these days. Although, it has to be said, back in the day, many Red Army soldiers hated Stalin and so weren't overly keen on fighting for him. Some are feeling that way now because, as we said, times have changed. Plus, some young men don't see Ukraine as a threat, not a threat like the Nazis were. Some of them are more than willing to give up a hunk of their metal rather than be burned inside it. Some feel like they're being ordered around by idiots, pretty much sent to their deaths. As we said, the Russian war plan hasn't so far been great. Many news services are reporting about Russians who are no longer willing to fight. One of them told the BBC in May, I don't want to go back to Ukraine and kill and be killed. He explained, We were like blind kittens. I'm shocked by our army. It wouldn't cost much to equip us. Why wasn't it done? He said so often they were told to move forward without any previous reconnaissance and with no protection. He makes a good point. Many people have commented on how atrocious Russian strategic efforts have been. This year, the longtime political activist, among many things, Noam Chomsky talked about the utter incompetence of the Russian military. He's not alone in saying that. Scores of Russian soldiers who've been to the front line won't go back, and some who are there now are not willing to die. Some of them have seen traffic jams of tanks on roads when they were easily picked off by US and UK made shoulder fired anti tank weapons. A Russian tank crew named Alexei was there for one such attack, later explaining everyone in the crew was shell shocked. They had no idea what had hit them. This sounds like shooting fish in a barrel. What you have is inexperienced young men taking orders that even to them don't seem rational, moving around in old tanks against some of the best anti tank weapons in the world. It used to be that tanks were the best things for taking out tanks, but now these lightweight weapons seem to be able to do the job and Ukraine is being sent them all the time. The Moscow Times wrote that some of the tanks that date back to the 60s have been fitted with makeshift cages on the tops. It's hardly what you'd call modern armor. The tank crews have also tried putting sandbags and pine logs on top of their tanks, but this won't help their chances of survival in any significant way. This is why some people say the tank age is over. They say tanks these days are just too vulnerable. Still, maybe this just applies to the old tanks. Even so, old and new tanks should be protected with Explosive Reactive Armor, or ERA, which does what it sounds like it would do. There's also Active Armor, which can sense incoming missiles and intercept them before they get to the tank. Why can't Russian tanks employ these features to defend themselves against missiles then? By the look of the battlefield, you'd think these tanks would struggle to react to an incoming tortoise. Even so, Russia has been a world leader in tank technology and armor technology. So why are its tanks being taken out so easily? Even though Russia has the know-how to stop it from happening, one analyst had this to say about that. The heavy attrition of Russian main battle tanks in Ukraine is highly likely partially due to Russia's failure to fit and properly employ adequate explosive reactive armor. It is highly likely that many Russian tank crews lack the training to maintain the ERA, leading to either poor fitting of the explosive elements of it or being left off entirely. So, this is more a human failure than it is a hardware failure, but it's more likely a bit of both. It might be down to money. Can Russia afford to protect its tanks the way they should be protected? Half the world is helping Ukraine in this war, and almost no one is helping Russia. Over $100 billion has been sent to aid Ukraine in total. The amount of weapons in those aid packages is staggering, way too many to list here. But be assured, the Western arms industry and its shareholders are having around-the-clock parties with by-the-minute champagne toasts just as Russian soldiers are being cooked alive by their weapons because no country is sending aid to Russia. But there's more. If you look at the video footage of Russian tanks being blown up, or if you take a close look at the dumped tanks, many of them have ERAs. Some don't, but that's probably because Ukrainians had already stripped them down. What does this mean? Well, firstly, there are various types of an ERA. Some are better than others. Also, ERA will help, but a strike can still be catastrophic. A missile can still lead to a deadly pop top, which means the turret is blown off. The sad fact is, for Russian soldiers, their armor is less effective than it should be, eight times less effective than a NATO tank, according to one expert. This means that the catastrophic kill rate in Russian tanks, especially the older ones, is really high. With the older tanks, it's more than just poor ERA or poor ERA management, but the tank's other attributes that are less than desirable. 
But as we said, it's more than just hardware. If you ask any analyst right now who knows this war inside and out, they'll also tell you that crappy tactics and appalling morale among troops count for a lot when it comes to that deathly landscape of fallen tanks in Ukraine. As for substandard tactics, Russian tanks often do a follow-the-leader movement, and that has been leading to bunch-ups, the fish-in-a-barrel formation. We made that formation up, of course, but you know what we mean. On top of that, as we said, you have lackluster coordination with infantry and artillery, which is just asking for trouble. Russia has done this time and again. Their tanks have been huddled up, left out in the open like blind mice among well-armed pigeons and the majority of time they haven't even had the slightest bit of camouflage. The era of the tank may not be nigh, but if you think Russia has the time and money to redesign tanks to make them less vulnerable, you'd likely be wrong. Still, Hitler did once underestimate Russia's weapon-building prowess. Right now, the worst job in the world has to be a Russian tank crew. Clank, 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 clank. It's the sound an infantryman dreads most. The sound of heavy steel tank treads coming your way. For the British paratroopers caught far behind enemy lines, it's the sound of death, and it's coming from all around. Operation Market Garden, meant to hasten the end of the war against Nazi Germany by as much as six months, is a complete disaster. The airborne assault was meant to secure vitally important bridges behind enemy lines, opening up an invasion route into northern Germany which would allow Allied troops to pour into the heart of the Nazi regime itself and rip it out while still beating. For the Nazis, this would be a strategic disaster and likely signaled the end of the war. With over 41,000 airborne troops, it's the largest airborne assault in history, and yet the Allies would severely underestimate the Germans, leading to a defeat five days later. For now, though, Major Robert Henry Kane, commander of Bravo Company, 2nd South Staffordshire Regiment of the 1st Airborne Division, has greater concerns than the imminent defeat of the ambitious Allied airborne thrust into Germany. He has two panzers bearing down on them, and and only a Piat projector infantry anti-tank to defend himself with. Allied armor never got the chance to make its crossing, and these tanks aren't going to blow themselves up. Bleeding from several bullet wounds, the good Major lifts up his Piat and takes aim at the lead tank. Five days earlier, and Major Kane is loaded up into a glider along with the rest of his men. The Allies have made extensive use of gliders to ferry airborne troops to battle, cheap and unpowered alternatives to the lumbering transport planes that tow them to their destinations. As the plane towing them lifts into the air, the glider soon follows suit and is quickly several thousand feet in the air. Then the first of many disasters strikes. The tow rope keeping the glider attached to its plane snaps, leaving the glider flying through the air completely unpowered. The pilot at the front desperately works the controls, trying to find a safe place to set the glider down. Despite being paratroopers, the men aren't wearing parachutes as they're meant to ride the glider all the way to their final destination, a battlefield in Belgium. While this places the men at more risk, the use of gliders also means that the men won't be as widely dispersed as they would be if they simply parachuted in, and allows them to retain unit cohesion and stay close to their supplies and heavy equipment. Incredibly though, the pilot manages to bring the glider down to a rough but safe stop on a nearby field, smashing into a tall hedge. The pilot is in disbelief. This exact same thing had happened to him on D-Day. Perhaps he's just lucky. For the Major though, he and his men had a battle to get to. Early the next day, Major Kane and his men make a rough landing near Arnhem. The Major's company currently involved in heavy fighting as they attempt to reach their target, the strategically important bridge at the town of Arnhem, which will allow Allied ground forces to cross the river and join the fight. If the bridge isn't taken, the ground assault element won't be able to cross, and this could spell doom for the entire operation. The Germans, however, are no fools, and they've set up a blocking force to stop the British soldiers from reaching their objective. For over a day, the fighting is intense, only barely letting up at night before resuming once more early the next morning. The British are in effect boxed in by German units and are receiving terrible casualties. Supported by artillery and self-propelled guns, the Germans completely outgun the relatively lightly armed British paratroopers and are decimating British forces. To make matters worse, the Germans now have tanks rumbling down on the Major and his men. With the Allied ground assault unable to cross the river, German panzers have been freed up from engaging Allied armor and now join in a push to eradicate the British and American paratroopers. Fighting that was desperate has just now been kicked up a notch as the tanks lend their cannons and machine guns to the fight. 
The only thing the paratroopers have to fight off the tanks with is the British Piat, a shoulder-fired anti-tank weapon that fires a 2.5-pound explosive warhead. The weapon has an advantage over the American bazooka and the German Panzerschreck, and that's the fact that it's spring-fired, meaning there's no distinctive puff of smoke that can give away a soldier's position as he fires it. However, this is where the Piat's strengths stop, and the weapon is largely inferior to either its American or German counterpart. For starters, the weapon sported less penetration power than a bazooka or a Panzerschreck, and it was extremely awkward to operate. The firing mechanism required two fingers to pull back, and as the weapon was spring-loaded, you had to put considerable effort into preparing it to fire. Once fired, though, the recoil from the weapon was so severe that men's shoulders were often dislocated, and at times their collarbones broken. After just a few firings, any soldier's shoulder would be bruised purple, and yet today they are the British paratroopers' only hope of fending off the German tanks. The Piats manage to hold off the advancing tanks, but the men are completely boxed in. The area is becoming a killing field, and a fighting withdrawal is ordered. By the time Major Kane manages to retreat, most of Alpha and Bravo Company has been destroyed, leaving only a handful of survivors. The losses are staggering. With no clear chain of command left surviving, Major Kane assumes command of all remaining survivors of the 2nd South Staffords. This leaves him with barely more than a reinforced company, and he orders the men to move to a more defensible position on high ground atop a hill a few hundred meters from the German blocking force. Their movement is spotted by German forward observers, though, and soon heavy mortar fire begins to rain down on the British. The men desperately try to dig in as the mortars explode around them, but the ground is hard and covered in thick roots, making it all but impossible to dig foxholes. Major Kane is wounded by shrapnel, adding to several other wounds already suffered. As more enemy tanks begin to roll toward them and the mortar fire eases off, the Major is starting to realize something. Someone in intelligence messed up. Bad. There weren't supposed to be so many German armored forces here, and yet somehow Allied intelligence missed the fact that the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Division had both been recently redeployed to the area. Thousands of Allied paratroopers armed with only the weapons they could carry on their backs had been sent to fight hundreds of heavy German tanks, supported by thousands of infantry equipped with self-propelled guns, artillery, and mortars. The operation had just begun two days prior, and it was already a bloodbath. Major Kane orders the survivors to fall back, and as the sun rises the next morning, he's been forced out of Arnhem. And of the 1,000 strong 2nd South Staffords, he now only commands a band of 100 soldiers, most of them wounded. Nonetheless, he orders the men to dig in. There's no escape for them, but if they can hold their ground, then possibly other Allied assaults might have been successful, and rescue could come from other bridgeheads. The Major has no way of knowing that Operation Market Garden is officially a failure, and one of the worst defeats of World War II. The Germans advance under cover of fighters and supported by self-propelled guns and tanks. The British are subjected to a blistering barrage of fire, and yet the men fight heroically, refusing to yield. The Germans hope to cut the British off from the river, which would make rescue impossible and doom the entire 1st Airborne to surrender or death. Despite being wounded and bleeding, Major Kane is moving from house to house, backpack full of rounds for his Piat. He pops up behind windows, attacking the tanks from their vulnerable sides and tops, and the only angle at which a Piat has a decent chance of defeating tank armor. His shoulder is turning black from the extreme pounding the spring-loaded weapon delivers on each firing. It feels like a horse kicking him square in the shoulder each time he pulls the trigger, and yet he knows that it's either this or death. The Germans are relentless. Falling back, Major Kane slips into a trench and calls out for an artillery officer to direct his fire with the Piat. The artillery officer, located on the second floor of an abandoned house, spots targets for the Major, and Major Kane lobs over four dozen rounds with the aid of the artillery officer. The Germans, however, have caught on, and a self-propelled gun turns to the direction of the house and fires, obliterating the upstairs floor and the officer there. The chimney comes crashing down, nearly crushing Major Kane to death. Major Kane, however, quickly gathers himself together and crawls forward through the trench. He spots another German Stug and fires, destroying the tank's treads. The tank fires back, missing the Major but throwing up great clouds of smoke and dust, which helps obscure the Major as he moves to a different position. The Major fires a second round, but the round fails to penetrate the thick armor, and the German tank fires back, throwing more debris into the air. A Panzer now joins the fight, and the Major pops up to fire off another Piat round at this new threat, only to be met by the ominous sound of a dull click. His weapon has misfired, and a split second later the timed explosive round blows up in his face. 
Major Kane is hurled backward, completely blinded with ruptured eardrums, and yet he is screaming, not in pain, but for his men to engage this new threat. Behind him, several soldiers manhandle a heavy 75mm American howitzer to face in the direction of the German tank, drop the barrel, and use the artillery piece as an anti-tank cannon, decimating the panzer. The Major is severely wounded and dragged back to a casualty collection point. Luckily for him, the explosive round has mostly exploded outward, and the blindness is temporary. His eardrums are shattered, though, and his vision is hazy. Plus, he's been wounded at least half a dozen times already and has lost a fair amount of blood. Nonetheless, the Major shoves the medics aside and 30 minutes later is back on the front line. By now, though, the company has run out of Piat ammunition, so the Major improvises. German flamethrower tanks are approaching and threatening to roast the British defenders to death, so the Major grabs a 2-inch mortar and levels it off at the approaching tanks, destroying the lead tank. He fires off several more shots from the improvised anti-tank weapon, and incredibly, the German tanks begin to pull back. The British defenders, no doubt emboldened by the absolute insanity of Major Kane's exploits, have managed to hold their ground. As night falls, boats manage to cross the river and reach the stranded British paratroopers. The Major refuses to leave the battlefield until every single survivor is aboard a boat, and before boarding himself, he finds a razor and a piece of mirror, taking the time to shave five days of stubble so that he could present himself to his superiors on the other side of the river as a proper British officer. Credited with destroying or disabling six enemy tanks and an unknown number of self-propelled guns, the Major would go on to win the Victoria Cross and was the only recipient to survive the most disastrous operation in the entire war. The Allies are winning in Europe and the end of the war is finally in sight. Suddenly, though, as British and American forces cross the German border, they come face to face with a 1,000-ton beast. The gunner that first spots one of those behemoths thinks he's seeing an optical illusion. He doesn't survive to figure out he's wrong as the mechanical monster fires its massive cannon and tears his tank in two. What follows is a bloodbath of epic proportions as titanic Nazi war machines tear through the hordes of Allied troops. This is the 1,000-ton German mega-tank, Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata, and there is no stopping it. Luckily, this gigantic tank would never see the light of day. It's scary to imagine what would have happened if Hitler and the Nazis had made it work, but the fact that precious resources were needed elsewhere to defend against Allied forces and the sheer magnitude of the project, the Rata was never built. That being said, the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata has an incredibly interesting history, especially when you consider how massive the tank was actually supposed to be. It would have been capable of carrying numerous turrets and anti-aircraft guns. Hitler's dream was to make the Rata into a battleship that moved across the land hence the name Land Cruiser. The main armament was even supposed to come off of an actual battleship, although it would need slight modifications. Being the biggest and heaviest tank ever built came with all sorts of problems, but Hitler was willing to overcome all of them to see this monstrosity of a tank become a reality. It was 1941 when the first ideas for the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata came about. German researchers were given orders to conduct a survey on Soviet heavy tanks and the best way to fight against them. The company that was in charge of the survey was a munitions and weapons company called Krupp. This project ended up being a source of inspiration for Nazi engineers, as it would end up leading to the Panzer VIII Maus super heavy tank being built. This tank was the precursor to the Rata. The man in charge of the study was Edvard Grotta, who was the director of Krupp at the time. Grotta had previously been a special officer in charge of submarine construction for the Nazi party. He used his background in naval construction along with the survey conducted on Soviet tanks to come up with the design for the Landcruiser P-1000 Rata. On June 23, 1942, Edward Grotta met with Adolf Hitler and other high-ranking members of the Nazi party. He was absolutely giddy about the plans for a new superweapon that he held in his hands. He pulled out the concept drawings for the Rata and began spewing out his ideas on how it would work and how it would essentially be a battleship that can move across a war zone destroying every allied force in its path. The land cruiser would be unstoppable, and the enemy would cower at its greatness. Hitler loved the idea and wanted one built as soon as possible, but as Grotta talked more about the tank specifications, other members of the Nazi party became concerned with the amount of resources that would need to be diverted from the production of other vehicles and weapons to complete the project. But as Grotta talked on and on about how powerful the Land Cruiser P-1000 would be, Hitler couldn't help but dream about the look on his enemies' faces as they gazed upon his massive tank. Edward Grotta explained that the main cannon 
would be a 28-centimeter SKC-34 naval gun turret, which could be taken from a Scharnhorst-class battleship. Originally, this turret had three cannons, but one would be removed to improve stability and allow for more munitions to be stored aboard the Rata. It would also reduce the weight of the already incredibly heavy tank by around 50 tons. The main armament would be fitted onto the main body of the tank using a 360-degree track, which would allow it to turn and fire in any direction. It could shoot both armor-piercing rounds or high-explosive rounds. Since these shells were designed for naval warfare, they could pack a serious punch and would obliterate any tanks, buildings, or enemy soldiers they hit. The land cruiser's biggest threat didn't come from Allied tanks but from their aircraft. This led to the future designs of the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata to include a 128mm anti-tank gun, along with eight 20mm Flak 38 anti-aircraft guns on the hull of the tank to deal with airborne attacks. To supplement the main cannons, the tank was also equipped with two 15mm Mauser MG-151-15 autocannons to fire at ground-based targets. The Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata was so huge that its design also included a vehicle bay that could house two BMW R12 motorcycles for scouting missions. Since the Land Cruiser itself would not move very fast, even in the best of terrain, the crew needed to have the ability to scout ahead and see what was coming. Like a naval ship, it would also have an infirmary and self-contained lavatory system on board. The tank would also have bunk rooms for the crew and numerous storage areas for supplies and extra ammunition. Basically, everything the crew would need to live and fight would be on board. The armor across the entire tank would almost be 10 inches thick to protect the humongous investment put into the tank and the crew that was inside. All in all, the armor would weigh around 200 tons. The guns and cannons would add an additional 300 tons to the overall weight of the Rata. Just the shell of the Land Cruiser would be 500 tons, and that was before adding tracks, engines, ammunition, supplies, and crew. The blueprint showed that the Land Cruiser would end up being around 128 feet long from the tip of the naval guns to the back of the tank, 36 feet high and 46 feet wide. With all this weight and the enormous size of the tank, Hitler and his advisors had some questions about how the whole thing would actually move, but Edward Grota had an answer for that as well. The Rata would include six heavy-duty tracks that would help distribute the weight of the tank evenly. They would each be 4 feet wide and 69 feet long. This would allow the Land Cruiser to traverse difficult terrain, which would be key if the tank was ever going to make it to battle. A 1,000-ton tank could easily get stuck in muddy or rocky areas, but if the tracks worked according to plan, the Land Cruiser would be able to roll right over anything that stood in its path. However, a main concern for everyone who saw the initial plans of the Rata was that even with the tracks, the weight of the tank would cause the moving fortress to sink deep into even the most solid ground. Wheels were out of the question, as they would need to be so gigantic the whole vehicle would be unstable. Tracks were needed to cross rivers, ditches, and forested areas because they gave the tank better weight distribution and grip on difficult terrain. The clearance from the ground to the underside of the Rata would be about 6.6 .6 feet. This was hypothesized to be tall enough to allow for it to ford most rivers with ease. Since the Land Cruiser was so heavy, it couldn't be loaded onto boats, as its weight would sink both vessels. And there were no bridges large or strong enough for the Rata to travel across. This meant that once the tank was in the field, it would need to be able to navigate any terrain it came across on its own. Now that Grota had sold his design to Hitler, who could barely contain his excitement over the idea, he needed to explain how this moving fortress would actually move. Grota and his team believed that two MAN V12 Z32 44 24-cylinder marine diesel engines could do the trick. The engines were used to propel U-boats through the oceans, so they would be ideal candidates for the Land Cruiser. Each engine could produce around 8,400 horsepower. The only problem would be that if one of the engines broke, the Land Cruiser was pretty much stuck where it was. This would make the Land Cruiser a sitting duck if Allied forces surrounded it and bombarded the tank from the ground or the air. The other option was to equip the tank with eight Daimler-Benz MB501 20-cylinder marine diesel engines. Each of these engines could produce around 2,000 horsepower, which would provide a little less power than the MAN engines. However, since there were eight of them, the tank could probably still move even if one or two went offline. It doesn't seem a final decision was ever made on what type of engine would be best for this new Wunderwaffe. Both engine options would require enormous amounts of diesel to move the Rata. It's estimated that the tank would go through a gallon of fuel a minute running at full power, which would only move the Land Cruiser around 25 miles per hour. Considering that Hitler's hopes and dreams hinged on the Rata crushing his enemies across Europe, the tank would require an almost unfathomable amount of diesel to meet his goals. Other tanks and military vehicles were transported long distances by railway, but the Rata was too large to fit through tunnels and there was no train large enough to carry it. 
At the time the land cruiser concept was brought to Adolf Hitler, Germany was already having problems with its supply lines. Getting oil out of the Middle East was becoming harder and harder as Italian forces were falling apart and the British were holding their own in the region. This problem was exasperated by the United States joining the war. The Nazis desperately needed more oil to keep their war machine running, and if the Rata was ever going to become a reality, it'd need a lot more of this vital resource. The decision was made to invade the Soviet Union to try to gain more resources, not so the land cruiser could be built, but so the Nazis could continue fighting the war. This decision would eventually lead to the Nazis' downfall and the end of the war in Europe. Regardless of the type of engines the tank was fitted with, the exhaust system would have been the same. All engines would be provided with snorkels similar to those used on German U-boats. Their connections between the submarine technology and the land cruiser were clearly Edward Grote using what he already knew and then transferring it to the weapon of his dreams. The snorkels would be constructed in a way that oxygen could still reach the Rata's engines even when the tank was traveling through deeper waters. The last thing the Nazis would want was their 1,000-ton tank stuck in a river with no power as the entire vessel began to fill up with water. One of the reasons Hitler might have been so open to the idea of the Land Cruiser was because he already loved another giant tank design called the Mouse. The original design was created by Ferdinand Porsche, the same gentleman responsible for creating fast sports cars and the People's Car, better known as Volkswagens. But the Mouse was not a car, it was actually the heaviest fully enclosed tank ever made. It ended up weighing around 200 tons. The Mouse was about 33 and a half feet long, which was twice as long as the Panzer III tank that had brought the Nazis success throughout the war. The Mouse was 12 feet high and had armor thicker than any naval ship at the time. Hitler was adamant that the tank be equipped with a 128mm Pak 44 Krupp Panzerabwehrkanone anti-tank cannon. Later, designs also included a coaxial 75mm gun to the main turret, a 7.92mm MG34 machine gun atop the turret, and an MG151 20 20mm anti-aircraft gun to defend the tank. Hitler's dream was to make the Land Cruiser the big brother to the Mouse, which is why it was given the name Rata. The Panzer VIII Mouse had one huge thing going for it that the Rata didn't though, it was actually built. Only two were ever completed, and of the two, only one of them made it to the battlefield before the end of the war. The Mouse and the Rata would have had very similar problems that made these tanks pretty much useless when it came to fighting in a battle. What were the biggest problems for a 1,000-ton tank? As 1943 progressed, the Nazis just couldn't afford to commit the amount of resources and manpower needed to build the Rata. Nazi leadership could not justify trying to construct the behemoth of a tank when it would end up being so impractical even if the Fuhrer wanted it to be a reality. Military strategists examined the Rata and determined that it could likely have been built, but it would not end up being the dream weapon that Grota and Hitler had imagined. Its 1,000-ton weight meant it would pulverize any roads it drove across. Maybe this wouldn't be a big deal for the Rata itself, but it would make everyone else's lives miserable. Other Germans who used the roads regularly for supply runs or just to move around the country would have had to travel across the jagged remains of concrete that the Rata left behind. As mentioned before, the size and weight of the Rata also meant it wouldn't be able to use bridges or trains, so deploying the tank anywhere quickly wasn't a possibility which is kind of a problem during wartime. The size of the tank would also make it an easy target for Allied bombers. Even though the Rata would be equipped with anti-air guns, there just wouldn't be enough firepower to stop multiple bombers from targeting the tank and managing at least a few direct hits during a run. The Rata's armor was thick, but multiple bombs slamming into the hull at the same time would be enough to at least damage some of its more vital components such as the engines or the tracks. After about a year of planning and crunching the numbers to see if the Land Cruiser Rata could somehow be built, Hitler's Minister of Armaments and War Production, Albert Speer, finally put an end to the madness. He explained that Nazi Germany was at a crossroads, and they needed to focus their resources on weapons that had already been proven to be effective such as the Panzer IV. However, the craziest part is that Grota and his team at Krupp had already started designing an even bigger tank. They'd taken the idea for the Rata and implemented a new weapon system. The idea was if they could build a 1,000-ton tank, then adding another 500 tons to it couldn't be all that hard. The team designed a second land cruiser and named it the Monster. Instead of using the 28cm SKC-34 naval gun turret, the P-1500 would use a more powerful weapon that Krupp had already designed. The Monster would be fitted with a modified version of the heavy Gustav 80cm railway gun. This was another massive weapon that just wasn't practical. It had been used once at the Siege of Sevastopol, where it took 4,000 men about five weeks to get the gun into firing position. After the heavy Gustav was in position, it required another 500 men to fire it. The siege lasted about a month and the heavy Gustav fired 47 rounds. 
The problem was that it had worn out its original barrel. The massive cannon needed to be shipped back to the Krupp factory in Germany to be refitted with a new barrel. This would be the only time the heavy Gustav would see battle, as the massive cannon was impractical and abandoned by the Nazi military. It was dismantled, and its pieces spread throughout the factory to keep the incoming Soviets from using the Nazis' own gigantic cannon against them. Yet, the planners of the monster didn't see the heavy Gustav as just a useless cannon. They were convinced that by incorporating the heavy Gustav onto the Land Cruiser P-1500 monster, all the problems with the original weapon could be solved. It would be more versatile and could travel wherever it was needed without the necessity of train tracks. Obviously, it would be incredibly slow and an easy target, but that didn't seem to concern Nazi engineers when they were designing the Wunderwaffe for the Führer. However, Speer would have none of it. When Hitler was preoccupied with news of his forces being defeated across Europe, Speer cancelled all projects related to the Land Cruiser, as well as the construction of any more Maus tanks. Unlike others in the Nazi party, he wasn't captivated by the dreams of gigantic weapons that may or may not have been practical. He was focused on building tanks and weapons that could possibly turn the war back in the Nazis' favor. Luckily, no matter what Speer did, the Nazis had already made too many mistakes and would not be able to recover. There is one terrifying thought, though, that we want to leave you with. What if Edward Grote had come up with the idea of the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata earlier? Could it have affected the outcome of the war? This huge tank would most certainly be a formidable machine to go up against in battle, but perhaps it would have been an even more dangerous psychological impact. The heavy Gustav was originally supposed to be constructed to aid in the demolition of French fortifications when the Nazis' invasion commenced. However, the Nazis found that capturing France was easier than they anticipated, and the invasion was complete before the heavy Gustav was in its testing phase. Likewise, World War II had been raging for a few years before the Rata was brought to Hitler's attention, which did not allow enough time for him to ever see this nightmare of a tank become reality. But what if those superweapons had been built before the start of World War II? The date is September 1, 1939. Adolf Hitler did the unthinkable and invaded Poland. The rest of Europe braces for what will inevitably be an all-out war. As reconnaissance planes fly over the borders of Germany, they spot gigantic moving structures from the sky. The crew notes that they didn't even need binoculars to spot these monstrosities, as they were so large that they could be seen from cruising altitude. What the Allied recon pilots have witnessed is a platoon of Land Cruiser P-1000 Ratas moving toward the French border. In this unthinkable imaginary scenario, the idea for the Land Cruiser was developed right when Hitler came to power, and its construction started almost immediately. The massive tanks are slow moving, but it seems as if nothing can stand in their way. France quickly falls with minimal casualties to Nazi forces. With the Land Cruisers on the battlefield, the German forces move from town to town and decimate any resistance by rolling the Ratas right into the middle of the fight. Nazi soldiers wait patiently in the bellies of the beasts until the battle is over, and then enter French towns and cities to round up anyone who's left alive. Germany begins fighting land battles as if they were naval battles. They deploy their Land Cruisers across Europe with Panzer tanks as support. When Allied forces try to reach the mainland on D-Day, they're greeted by a Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata on the beach of Normandy. Their bullets do nothing to its thick armor, and the main cannons are able to fire at the ships that sit offshore, causing them to retreat. In the Soviet Union, the Rata platoons are slowly making progress through the harsh Russian landscape. Luckily for the Nazis, the moving fortresses keep them warm during the brutal Soviet winters. They begun capturing oil wells as they progress deeper into Soviet territory to keep the diesel engines running. It's not a pleasant experience living for months inside of a Rata, but it is doable. As the winter gives way to spring, the Land Cruisers move forward and capture more land. By having dozens of Land Cruiser P-1000 Ratas at their disposal, the Nazis have been able to establish footholds in the region that they would have not been able to otherwise. Once a Land Cruiser is deployed and is set up in a defensive position, it's almost impossible to destroy. As Allied forces focus on trying to eliminate these huge deadly targets, the German Air Force and infantry launch counteroffensives. In a worst-case scenario, the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata would serve as a powerful distraction. With Allied forces tied up trying to destroy these monstrous tanks, the Nazis can devote more forces to secure resources and fuel for their war machine. The Allies are focusing too heavily on trying to build their own gigantic tanks or finding ways to defeat the Nazi Land Cruisers, and they leave themselves vulnerable. Nazi aircraft and soldiers invade Allied countries while their attention is focused elsewhere. The Nazis now control all of Europe, and World War II ends much differently. This scenario could also go a very different way if Germany started building dozens of Land Cruiser P-1000 Rathas before World War II. The Nazis pour resources into the Land Cruisers only to find they break down constantly and get stuck every few miles. In this case, World War II might have come to a quicker end, as the Nazis would have depleted their resources early on by building completely useless 1,000-ton tanks. 
There's no denying that if the Nazis had been able to build a land cruiser, it would have taken a psychological toll on any Allied soldier who looked upon it. The 1,000-ton tank would have been a terrifying sight to behold. If one of those fortresses was able to move across Europe, the Allies likely would have devoted huge amounts of men and resources to try to stop it. If nothing else, the Rata would be able to cause massive amounts of destruction and fear until Allied forces dealt with it or it broke down under its own weight. There are some historians who believe that the design for the land cruiser Rata didn't even make it to Hitler's office. Most think that he asked for a feasibility study for a 1,000-ton tank in 1942, but the design for the Rata is just a fabrication. It could have been a hoax or an engineer's dream tank that he concocted for his own amusement. Currently, there can be arguments made for both sides. Adolf Hitler was a nut job, who most definitely wanted a 1,000-ton tank, but it's not clear how far the plans actually got. Edward Grota and the Krupp company built some pretty insane vehicles and weapons. We also know there were a number of other Wunderwaffe that Hitler planned on building once he secured the resources to do so. It seems likely he would have wanted the Land Cruiser P-1000 Rata to be one of them. Right now, we can only speculate on how a massive Land Cruiser would have affected the outcome of World War II. Maybe the Rata would have turned the tide of the war back in Germany's favor, or perhaps if the tank was built, it would have caused so much destruction to the roads as it drove across Nazi infrastructure that it would have had to expedite their downfall. Either way, the thought of a thousand-ton tank in the hands of Adolf Hitler is a terrifying one. Its cannon can fire laser-guided anti-tank missiles. Its armor is impenetrable to anything but nuclear weapons. It can kill 10 American M1 Abrams standing front to back in a row with just one shot. If the Russian Ministry of Defense and the Russian military bloggers are to be believed, the T-14 is the deadliest tank ever created, past, present, and future. But if it's so good, why isn't it in Ukraine, where it's needed the most? The T-14 really is quite impressive, at least on paper. Then again, up until eight months ago, the Russian military was also quite impressive on paper. If the T-14 was a paper tiger, though, it was one with some serious capital investment. We know, after eight months of war, that the Russian government never lies. And we do know that the T-14 Armada has been announced in full production at least half a dozen times in the last ten years. Originally, the Russian military was supposed to acquire 2,300 of these monsters between 2015 and 2020, making Western analysts absolutely brown their pants at the time, back when the West actually believed a single word coming out of the Kremlin. However, when 2015 rolled around, not a single T-14 had been delivered, and the tank was still in prototype testing. In 2016, some Western news outlets reported that the T-14 was in fact on its way to crush democracy. The National Interest ran a story on March 13, 2016 saying, Surprise! Russia's lethal T-14 Armada tank is in production. The source for the article was a quote from a top Russian defense industry executive, or basically a trust me bro. Yet, 2016 came and passed without a single T-14 in active service, and by July 20, 2018, Russia made the announcement that in effect indefinitely postponed any deliveries of T-14s, similar to the announcement made on the Su-57 Felon around that same time period. In 2021, Russian state-owned TASS media outlet reported that the tank would finally begin serial production in 2022, with serial production starting in December 2021. Mysteriously, not a single T-14 has been verified to be in active military service, though TASS did announce that the tank had been sent to Syria for testing in battlefield conditions. No other media in the world could verify this, and rumors circulating online that one T-14 was destroyed by Syrian rebels using an American tow missile are also unverified. But let's wind the clock back and look at the background of the T-14, its alleged capabilities and why Russia seems to be incapable of bringing these capabilities to a battlefield near you anytime soon. The T-14 was a seismic shift in Russian tank design. Back in 2010, Russia was developing the T-95, an upgrade over traditional Soviet-style tank designs. However, it was concluded that what Russia needed to be a relevant tank force in future conflicts was not an upgrade, but a complete evolutionary leap forward, leaving old Soviet tank design behind. The United States faced a similar problem back in the 1980s when it introduced the M1 Abrams. Originally, the US was simply going to continue evolving its M60 main battle tank, but the threat of overwhelming numbers of armed forces in Eastern Europe meant that it was time to throw the entire design out and work on something brand new. Like the M1 Abrams, it was built to face a specific threat, a defensive land battle against overwhelming numbers. The T-14 was born from discarded Soviet upgrades with the goal of building the tank around brand new technologies. It would be Russia's boldest leap forward in tank design for generations. While today it's easy to consider the Russian military laughable, the truth is Soviet designers knew what they were doing in making tanks. 
The Soviet Union fielded some truly fearsome tanks, many times superior to their Western counterparts. While the West held the advantage in the air and at sea, the Soviet Union was decisively the superior land power, perhaps not in doctrine but certainly in its armored forces. This expertise has continued to be handed down to modern Russia, and if at least half of its capabilities were real and not propaganda, it was a weapon to be feared. The T-14 would ditch traditional Soviet-style hulls to feature a more Western-style boxy turret and a low-profile body. This makes the T-14 a smaller target on the battlefield and can seriously improve crew safety by keeping them out of the line of fire. However, this redesign fixes one major flaw in nearly all tanks Russia has in service today, a flaw seen in full effect in Ukraine that has spawned an endless host of memes. Russian tanks store ammunition in the armored turret, which makes it easier for the autoloader to do its job. However, this also leaves the tank extremely vulnerable to top attack munitions, as any hit on the turret is guaranteed to light off this ammunition. In effect, Russian tanks have a tendency to blow their tops sky high and send the vaporized ashes of their crews into the stratosphere. Western designers, meanwhile, decided their tanks should be tanks and not rockets, and put the ammunition in the specially designed storage spaces with the blowout panels. The T-14 takes a cue from the West in this regard, much to the relief of Russian tankers, with no hopes of becoming astronauts one day. But the T-14 introduces a brand new feature that even the United States has yet to adopt. The turret can typically be a serious liability for the crew, and for it to do its job it can't be as well armored as the rest of the body. That's bad news for the tank commander, whose seat is typically in the turret. However, the T-14 features an unmanned turret, which allows the crew to remote control it from the safety of their seats inside the body of the tank. In fact, the entire crew compartment is a densely protected armored capsule that the crew sits in, affording greatly increased survivability. The tank also features an upgraded barrel with increased range and lethality, as well as a host of modern upgrades including GPS, satellite communications, and even a meteorological mast to feed the environmental data to the fire control computer to greatly increase accuracy. So if the T-14 is so competent, why in the world isn't it in full production and storming the front lines in Ukraine today? Russia's attitude toward the T-14 appears to be a conundrum. The nation has gone to great lengths to tout its lethality and capabilities over even the most advanced Western designs, and is putting great effort into pressuring nations like India to buy it. Yet the Russian government seems completely uninterested in actually buying the tank itself. At the Army 2022 Expo, Rosoboron Export, the state-owned arms company that manufactures the Armata line of combat vehicles, was seen trying to garner international interest for the T-14s, while a TASS news article continued to speak out about its capabilities. Yet, instead of buying the revolutionary tank itself, Russia was trying to pawn it off on foreign buyers, a move that no doubt raised serious eyebrows from anyone considering buying the tank. The T-14 might arouse comparison to the Su-57 widely considered to be a dud and the worst of all fifth-generation fighter designs. The Su-57 was claimed to be superior to even US F-22s, the stealthiest fifth-generation fighter in the world, but this was demonstrably a lie. India, which was initially a partner in developing the Su-57, eventually pulled its funding from the program, citing serious questions about its effectiveness, stealth characteristics, and the ability to survive against other fifth-generation aircraft such as American F-22s and F-35s and Chinese J-20s. The pullout of Indian funding effectively killed Russia's ability to manufacture the Su-57, and to this day, only a little over a dozen of the aircraft are operational. However, while the Su-57 is on simple observation inferior in design to its counterparts, the T-14 appears to be the real deal and is backed by generations of Russian tank design know-how. The real reason why the Russian military might be passing on the tank is unlikely to be that it's a dud, but rather because Russia is facing the same problem the US was in the mid-2000s. With the turn of the millennium came a slew of revolutionary new military technologies and some serious spending around the world on developing and integrating them into active fighting forces. Nobody spent more than the US, which famously put nearly $20 billion into its future combat systems program. However, all this tech came at serious cost to develop and purchase, and in the end, America's spending frenzy resulted in exactly zero active service weapon platforms. Instead, the US scaled back its ambitions and started spending on slow, incremental, and proven upgrades rather than moonshots. Russia seems to be facing the same issue, only on a budget the fraction the size of America's. And that means that Russia's dreams of a horde of 2300 of this cutting-edge tank are simply financially impossible. Identifying these budgetary shortfalls as far back as 2016, Russia instead has been funneling money into modern upgrades for its existing tank fleet. 
rather than new acquisitions, and this left the T-14 without domestic support. So with a price tag of nearly $4 million each, the T-14 is a significant investment for any country, though it is still significantly behind America's Abrams which comes in at nearly $10 million in the most modern variant. With a much smaller budget than the US, any hopes of acquiring the T-14 in large numbers were extremely unlikely in the past. Today, it is simply impossible. Sanctions against Russia for its invasion of Ukraine are having a significant economic impact, which has to date been delayed due to a massive war chest of over $300 billion that Putin had been holding in reserve for exactly the scenario. That money, originally as much as $700 billion, most of which was frozen in Western banks, is going to be running out soon though, and that's when Putin will be unable to offset the damage of the sanctions. So in other words, there's some very lean times ahead for the Russian military budget especially as millions of professionals have left the country, further eroding its economy. The biggest death knell for Russia's acquisition of the T-14, however, and perhaps its ability to even manufacture it for foreign buyers should it find any, are sanctions targeting the nation's technology sector. The West and its partners around the world have in effect cut Russia off from the global technology market. Making access to advanced electronic components the T-14 and other modern weapons need much more difficult and expensive. Russia is quite adept at sanction busting, but it's going to be impossible for the nation to illicitly get its hands on enough materials to build and maintain a fleet of over 2,000 high-tech tanks. Yet, we know Russia does have a small number of T-14s that it's been using for testing and prototyping. So why isn't it sending these to the front? The answer comes down to one simple comparison. A T-14 Armada tank costs approximately $4 million. A US Javelin anti-tank missile costs around 250000 the US has supplied Ukraine with hundreds of this weapon system, and losing a single T-14 to a Javelin or a British in-law is in effect an economic disaster in the making. Then there is the huge loss in international prestige should Russia lose its most modern tank to a military that's supposed to be vastly inferior to itself. The same reason why we've yet to see the Su-57 in combat over Ukraine. It's not known how many T-14s Russia has actually built, but the numbers believed to be less than 100. Even if Russia wanted to send them to the front lines, there's simply not enough of them to form operational units out of. Instead, these ultra-modern T-14s would find themselves fighting alongside much more dated models, making them vulnerable on the battlefield. With too few T-14s to be used effectively, Russia is best served by using its old tank stockpiles rather than sending their new tanks to certain destruction or simply abandonment in Ukraine. After all, the shame of having a Ukrainian farmer tow away Russia's most advanced tank with a tractor might be what finally does the Russian military in. German Field Marshal von Kleist called it the best tank of World War II. Panzer leader General Heinz Guderian, upon first encountering the Red Army's T-34, said the tank enjoyed vast superiority over German tanks. The Soviets wove legendary tales around its incredible performance on the battlefields of Eastern Europe. But what exactly made the T-34 the best tank of World War II? Design on the T-34 began in late 1930, when the Red Army was mostly equipped with T-26 or Bistrochodny light tanks, which were fast and agile units but were seriously lacking in protection and firepower. Both tanks had seen action during the Spanish Civil War, when Soviet forces backed up Spanish communists, and during the Soviet Union's undeclared border war with Japan. During the 1938 to 1939 border skirmish with Japan, the Red Army's tanks were roundly defeated by the low-powered but still superior Japanese Type 95 tanks. Infantrymen also scored many kills on Soviet tanks by assaulting them with Molotov cocktails, which turned the tank into a giant fireball when flaming gasoline dripped through chinks in the poorly welded armor and into the tank's engine compartment. Clearly, the Soviet Union needed a replacement tank for its ground forces, and it needed one as soon as possible. Though Hitler had declared a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, its poor performance against both Japan and then later against Finland in the Winter War sent a strong signal that the Red Army was weak, and there was nothing Stalin feared more than Hitler turning his forces loose on him. The first prototypes of the T-34 entered production in 1939 and featured a coil spring Christie suspension, similar to the previous BT series of tanks, allowing them to achieve higher speeds than other tanks in service around the world. The new track design also gave the entire tank an incredibly low ground pressure of 0.64 kg per centimeter square, or just slightly higher than the pressure the average human footprint exerts on the ground. This means that the T-34 would be much more maneuverable and less likely to get bogged down by snow and thick mud, two environments that were intimately familiar to people living on Russia's western steppes. 
the gasoline engine, so vulnerable to going up in flames from Molotov attack, was replaced with a diesel engine, giving it enough horsepower to push the T-34 along at speeds of up to 34 miles an hour. This made the T-34 10 miles per hour faster than the German Panzer III or Panzer IV. It also featured a revolutionary sloped armor design that was 45 mm thick. The 60 degree slope on the armor effectively meant that any incoming round had to penetrate an extra 5 mm of armor, increasing armor protection without adding excess weight. The slope, however, also helped ensure that most incoming projectiles on a horizontal trajectory would bounce harmlessly off the armor. The main gun was a major upgrade over previous Soviet designs and featured a 76 mm cannon with a muzzle velocity of around 2,000 feet per second, allowing the T-34 to score kills on any other tank in the world at even long ranges. With so much fanfare around the production of the T-34, designer Mikhail Koshkin completed two prototypes in January of 1940 and decided to subject the tanks to an extremely grueling trial by fire. He drove both tanks from Ukraine to Moscow, or about 745 miles, and then to the border with Finland, on to Kiev, and lastly back to the factory in Kharkov. The incredible endurance test proved that the tanks were built to last and structurally sound and only minor modifications were required to the suspension and drivetrain before the tank went into full-scale production. However, Koshkin ended up contracting pneumonia during the journey and would die, replaced as head of the T-34 program by his deputy, Alexander Morozov. With a spectacular endurance trial under its belt, full-scale production of the T-34 began in September of 1941 at the Kharkov Komintern locomotive plant with concurrent production beginning six months later at the Stalingrad tractor factory. The tank would see four different versions, all equipped with the mighty 76mm gun, and the first version of the T-34 was formally recognized by the Red Army as the Model 1940. Unfortunately, though Soviet engineering was still catching up with the rest of the world, its manufacturing still lacked the raw skill and expertise needed to build modern tanks. Instead of the much more powerful and safer V-12 diesel engine, many early T-34s were instead fitted with the MT-17 gasoline engines due to the difficulty in the manufacturing process of the V-12s. The initial L-11 76mm gun was also quickly found to have very poor penetration capability against armored targets and was hastily replaced with the F-34 76mm gun. With an improved muzzle velocity of 2130 feet per second, the new cannon proved more effective at punching through German armor, and the new model of T-34 was designated as the Model 1941, seeing as it began to enter service in the summer of 1941. On June 22, 1941, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa, his planned killing stroke to defeat the communist government of the Soviet Union. With more than 3 million soldiers, 150 divisions, and 3,000 tanks making up three army groups, the German advance created an initial front more than 1,800 miles long. Initially, the Germans scored victory after victory, pushing the Soviet forces even further back. However, a few months after the start of the offensive, the Red Army began to receive the T-34 in force, and the Germans were shocked at the mighty new tanks leading Soviet counterattacks. German Panzer III's found that their 50mm gun was all but useless against the sloped frontal armor of the T-34, as was the 50mm Pac-38 anti-tank gun used by support units. German tank commanders were soon finding out that their only hope of stopping the T-34 was to outmaneuver it. No easy feat, given that the T-34 was light on its feet and very capable within the muddy and snowy conditions of western Russia, while heavy German Panzers tended to bog down. Nonetheless, superior German training saw Soviet forces outmaneuvered time and again, and the T-34 suffered heavy casualties. Though even with their inferior training and communications, T-34s managed to stop the German advance into the Soviet Union. For all its strengths though, the T-34 had some serious drawbacks as well. First was the poor Soviet worksmanship, as the T-34 was largely built by an inexperienced workforce with very low expertise. The need to hurry tanks through the production process saw many corners cut, and overall while the T-34 was one of the best designed tanks of the Second World War, it was often betrayed in reality by the poor worksmanship that went into its construction. Physical failures experienced by the tank were often more the fault of the rushed labor that went into its construction and less a fault with the core design itself. The T-34 also had a two-man manually traversed turret, which required the commander to also act as a gunner. 
This would place a huge workload on the tank commander, which would take precious time away from his most vital task, actually commanding the tank. For platoon leaders, this made maintaining command and control over an entire platoon, and not just his own tank, virtually impossible, and was one of the leading causes for the poor performance of Soviet tank forces against the Germans. The turret also lacked a basket, or raised floor which moved along with the turret, as the turret turned from side to side, which meant that the tank crews were constantly in danger of tripping over spent shells as the turret moved. Visibility was also a major problem for T-34 tank commanders, as the tank lacked a cupola and periscope standard amongst all other allied tanks. This problem was rectified in the T-34 model 1943, but until then tank commanders often entered into battle with the main hatch physically open, ducking behind it as they struggled to make sense of the battlefield. Needless to say, riding into battle with your main hatch open was a very bad idea, but better than riding into battle blind. The armor of the T-34 was also extremely rigid and would fail to provide any give when struck by a round. This meant that the force of the impacting round may not penetrate the thick armor, but could still generate lethal steel splinters on the inside of the tank, which would kill or seriously injure crew members. The steep slope of the armor also made the T-34 a very cramped machine. And when the US Army engineers tested a T-34 in 1942, they were amazed that the Soviets could fit four fully equipped crewmen inside the tank. The cramped space, however, also meant that the sides of the hull had to be lined with fuel cells, which could be easily breached if hit by armor-piercing rounds. The other major drawback of the T-34 was the lack of a radio on each tank, with only the tanks of a platoon leader being equipped with a radio. Communications between tanks was instead meant to be done with flags, an absolutely flabbergasting proposition amidst the ferocity of tank combat. While German tanks were coordinating with each other via radio, the Soviet tankers were expected to somehow wave flags at each other in order to coordinate their movements, and this with the T-34's notoriously low visibility. As a result, despite the capabilities of the T-34, Soviet tankers were routinely outfought by the Germans. The most serious vulnerability of the T-34, though, was the very poor worksmanship with random tests of newly completed T-34s in 1942 showing that only 7% were free of major defects. In 1943, random T-34s were taken directly from the production lines and subjected to a 300km reliability trial, with less than 8% of T-34s being able to complete the trial without breaking down. Just on their way to combat, Soviet tank brigades were known to experience losses of 30% to 50% of their tanks in transit, without even seeing enemy action, and the average T-34 lasted less than 124 miles before needing major repairs or overhauls. A T-34 could barely get through its first full tank of diesel before needing repair. With all these vulnerabilities, it can be hard to truly consider the T-34 the best tank of World War II, but it's important to remember that many of the T-34 defects were down to the poor worksmanship of what was essentially a hastily assembled labor force of unskilled peasants. The Soviets were desperate, with their backs up against the wall, and it showed in the many, many defects built into the T-34. Yet the core design on paper was always good, and its tactical limitations and vulnerabilities were quickly addressed, with fixes implemented into new models. However, one of the key qualities that makes the T-34 the best tank of World War II was the ease with which it could be produced. With the Soviets producing over 30,000 T-34s between 1941 and 1943, versus just over 5,000 German Panzer IVs, the T-34 was truly great because it may not have been the best engineered design, but it was a very strong design that could be built quickly and cheaply, even with a very inexperienced and poor quality workforce, which turned out to be a critical advantage over the Germans' Tiger and Panzer tanks. Armed with a cannon, missiles, and machine guns. Tanks are the ultimate weapon and dominate in the battlefield. They remove man from the limitations of his frail flesh and wrap him in several inches of solid steel and high-tech ceramics, turning him into a modern Roman god of war, dispensing death and destruction to his enemies. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographic Show. Today we're taking a look at 50 incredible facts about tanks. 50. Tanks first saw duty in September 1916, during World War I at the Battle of the Somme. Envisioned as a way of breaking the gridlock of trench warfare, most of these primitive tanks quickly broke down, and their ultimate effect on the enemy was more psychological than kinetic. 49. 
Tanks got their name from the British. During their development, the Brits took to calling the massive machine tanks. To make any German spies think that they were building massive water tanks to provide water to troops. 48. The very first tank, the Mark I, weighed 26 tons and was armed with 57mm guns. It had a top speed of 3.7 miles per hour. 47. A modern American Abrams M1A2 tank by comparison weighs 68.7 tons and is armed with a 120mm cannon. It has a top speed of 41.5 miles per hour. 46. Tanks were categorized by gender depending on their armament during World War I. Male tanks had cannons and female tanks had machine guns. 45. Despite their terrifying presence on a battlefield, early tanks were not particularly effective. By the end of the fourth day of the Battle of Amiens in 1918, the British Tank Corps, which had consisted of over 500 tanks, was left with only six. 44. Britain and France manufactured a total of 6,506 tanks during World War I, while Germany built only 20 between 1916 and 1918. 43. The smallest tank ever made was the French Renault UE Chenillette, just under 9 feet long and 4 feet tall. 42. The largest tank battle in history was the Battle of Kursk in July 1943. An estimated 23,000 tanks and over 4 million men took part, and at the end of the battle the Germans lost 350 tanks versus 800 by the Russians. 41. The world's most expensive tank is the French Army's AMX-53 Leclerc, with an estimated cost of $12.5 million. 40. With over 22,000 tanks of varying degrees of modernity, Russia commands the largest battle tank force in the world. 39. The United States with 9,000 tanks is second to Russia in tank numbers. 38. The Russian military routinely hosts a tank biathlon that tests the crew's ability to provide accurate and rapid fire under a variety of terrain conditions, as well as tests the ruggedness and the durability of the vehicles themselves. 37. In 2015, 17 nations were invited to take part in Russia's tank biathlon, including Angola, Kuwait, Nicaragua, China, India, and Venezuela. Russia won all 13 categories of the tournament, and all nations except China competed using the Russian-built T-72 tank. 36. The Battle of Golan Heights between Israel and Syria is considered the greatest tank battle ever fought in terms of military success. An Israeli defense force of 3,000 troops, 180 tanks, and 60 artillery pieces brought an assault of 28,000 Syrian troops, 800 tanks, and 600 artillery pieces to a dead standstill. 35. Russia's T-54 and T-55 series of tanks are the most widely produced tank models in the world. Debuting in 1943, over 100,000 have been built, and their most recent use came during the Libyan Civil War in 2011. 34. The most technologically advanced tank in the world is widely believed to be the US's M1A2 Abrams, with a host of communications, surveillance, and electronic defense and countermeasures. 33. Russia's T-90 tank is equipped with the largest cannon in the world at 125mm. Russia's next generation T-14 Armada, however, also has a 125mm cannon, but can be upgraded to a 152mm cannon in the future for some serious power. 32. The Battle of 73 Easting during the First Gulf War in 1991 is considered the last great tank battle of the 20th century and pitted Iraq's elite Republican Guard forces against the US's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd armored divisions. 31. Despite being widely feared for their expertise, even amongst American commanders, the battle was nearly completely one-sided against Iraq's Republican Guard forces, with Iraq suffering up to 1,000 killed and wounded, 1,300 prisoners taken, 160 tanks destroyed, 180 personnel carriers destroyed, 12 artillery pieces destroyed, and 80 wheeled support vehicles destroyed. The US suffered 6 killed in action, 19 wounded, and one Bradley Infantry fighting vehicle destroyed. 
30, the stunning outcome of the Battle of 73 Easting led to Russian designers rethinking several elements of the T-72's design. As the T-72 had been the tank most in use by Iraqi forces, Russian military leadership concluded after the battle that the only way to stop an American armored advance would be the use of tactical nuclear weapons. 29. Russia's next-generation T-14 tank is possibly the most advanced main battle tank in the world. Unfortunately, its ballooning costs has led Russia to scrapping plans to buy more than 100 of them, and is instead turning to updating older T-72, T-80, and T-90 tanks instead. 28. Poland is experimenting with what it calls the tank of the future. Called the PL-01, the tank is coated with a chameleon-like skin that enables it to mimic the infrared signature of its surroundings, making it much harder to detect with infrared sensors. 27. The US Abrams M1A1 is considered the best all-around tank in the world, with Russia's T-14 directly challenging it for the top spot. However, the undisputed best protected tank in the world is Britain's Challenger 2, with its state-of-the-art composite Chobham armor, a classified secret. 26. During NATO's invasion of Iraq, a British Challenger 2 was struck by 14 RPGs and one anti-tank missile. The crew survived and the tank was back in operation six hours later. 25. Another Challenger was later hit by 70 RPGs and also survived. 24. The only Challenger 2 ever destroyed in combat was a friendly fire incident in 2003. No Challenger 2 has ever been lost to enemy action. 23. The fastest tank in the world is the British FV-101 Scorpion, which can reach speeds over 51 miles per hour. 22. Syrian rebels have developed their own homemade tank, the Sham 2. It's equipped with several inches of steel and iron armor and a turret-mounted machine gun. Five video cameras ring the tank, and a PlayStation controller operates the machine gun. 21. During the Korean War, U.S. soldier Eduardo C. Gomez took out an enemy tank single-handedly by crawling across an open rice field, climbing atop the tank, and prying open the hatch before dropping a grenade inside. Remembering to lock the hatch has been an important element of tank crew training since. 20. During the Battle of Stalingrad, factories in the war-torn city continued to produce tanks unabated. The tanks were unpainted and lacked gun sights, and driven straight from the factory floor to the front line. 19. During World War II, a single Soviet KV-1 tank stalled the advance of an entire German division for a full day. Facing off against an infantry assault, several German tanks, and German anti-tank guns, grenades thrown into the hatches eventually killed the crew inside, which were buried with full military honors after the battle by the Germans. 18. An Australian MK3 Centurion, serial number 169041, was nicknamed the Atomic Tank after surviving a 9.1 kiloton nuclear blast from 460 meters away. The tank was driven off after the test and served for another 23 years. 17. In 1989, as part of a crackdown against pro-democracy protests, Chinese tanks massacred 300 students protesting the communist government. 16. The most famous image of the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests is that of a single man stopping a column of tanks with a raised hand, quickly spread around the world, and is today one of the most iconic images ever captured. Yet, as it is heavily censored in China, most Chinese do not recognize it. 15. A tank designed by the Swiss military once suffered from a bug where turning on the heater might cause the main gun to fire. This would prove to be particularly tragic in a country with as chilly winters as Sweden's. 14. The longest tank-to-tank -tank kill in history occurred when a British Challenger tank destroyed an Iraqi T-62 at a range of 5,100 meters, or over 3 miles. 13. In 2006, Hungarian protesters hotwired a 50-year-old Soviet T-34 tank that was part of an outdoor memorial and drove it against riot police. 12. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union developed a laser tank equipped with artificial ruby-powered lasers. The 1K17 Skatia was meant to destroy enemy optical equipment, but proved too expensive to be practical. 11. During World War II, the US developed a prototype super tank 
the T-28 Super Heavy Tank. Weighing in at nearly 100 tons, this monster was meant to break through the German defenses of the Siegfried Line, but was ultimately abandoned. 10. The Brad Pitt World War II film Fury featured an authentic and operational Tiger I tank from World War II, the first time such a vehicle has ever appeared on film. 9. Of 1,300 of Germany's fearsome Tiger I tanks, widely believed to be some of the best made during World War II, only seven remain intact today. 8. As a way to defeat German tanks, the Soviets trained dogs to carry bombs attached to their backs and crawl under enemy tanks before detonating. However, because Soviet tanks were used in the training, when deployed the dogs targeted Russian tanks instead of German tanks. A slight oversight. 7. Arnold Schwarzenegger served as a tank crew member during his mandatory service in the Austrian Armed Forces in 1965. Later, he bought the same tank he served in, an M47, and now uses it to support charitable causes. 6. Drive a Tank, a business in Casota, Minnesota, is the only place in the United States civilians are allowed to drive a military tank. 5. During World War II, German tanks were coated with a putty-like material known as Zimmerit to prevent magnetic mines from sticking to them. 4. Object 269 was a Soviet tank developed in 1959 that was designed to survive a nuclear explosion. Little did the Soviets know that the Australians had apparently beaten them to the punch. 3. Along with the British Challenger, no American Abrams tank has ever been destroyed in combat by enemy fire. 2. Since World War II, all British tanks are equipped with a device that allows for the heating of water called a boiling vessel. Rumored to have been developed because British soldiers used to have to exit their tank to boil water and make tea, which endangered them and wasted time. 1. The Nazis once planned a truly monstrous tank, named appropriately enough the P-1500 Monster. Weighing 1,500 tons, the tank was too big for road or rail and was designed as a land battleship with a crew of 100 plus. Despite Hitler eagerly okaying the concept, it was eventually scrapped. The year is 117 CE, and the Roman Empire under Emperor Trajan is at the height of its economic, political, and military power. The mighty civilization would hold strong for another several hundred years before finally collapsing, in part because nobody could defeat the empire's legionnaires, a well-trained, well-equipped, and rightly feared fighting force. While very few of the empire's contemporaries could stand against these soldiers, what if we introduced a more interesting challenger into the mix, an M1 Abrams tank? commonly used by the modern armies of the United States, Iraq, Kuwait, Australia, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, transported back to ancient times. That's right, the Roman Empire had plenty of iconic enemies, from the brutal Attila the Hun to the elephant-riding Hannibal of Carthage, but few could pose a real threat to the empire's dominance. So it's perhaps worth asking if any of these enemies had even one operational M1 Abrams, would the sum of Rome's legionnaires be able to stand against them? Would the armored soldiers of the Roman legion go weak at the knees at the approach of an M1's rumbling caterpillar tracks, or would they stand their ground and use their advanced military tactics to win the day against their more physically powerful Foam. It's an epic battle between some of the grandfathers of military innovation and one of the 20th and 21st century's most deadly and enduring pieces of hardcore military hardware, employed everywhere from the Persian Gulf War to the modern skirmishes in the Middle East. As in any battle between two legendary forces, we need to first pick their battleground. Thankfully, this is an area where the Roman Empire and the M1 Abrams quite literally have common ground. As we just mentioned, the M1 Abrams cut its teeth in the Persian Gulf Wars, otherwise known as Operation Desert Storm in Iraq. Well over a thousand years earlier, the Roman Empire was fighting against the Sasanian Empire in the latter half of the Roman-Persia Wars, in what would now be known as the neighboring country of Iran. So the Middle East is where the game is set for this clash of military titans. In terms of strategic terrain, Iran and Iraq are famous for their rugged, mountainous environment, a battleground bound to be treacherous for any force that isn't adequately prepared. Hence why guerrilla forces with prior knowledge of an area have always historically had a home team tactical advantage. It's important to remember that largely thanks to improvements in both communication technology and weaponry, modern warfare moves a lot faster than the conflicts of old. The Gulf War didn't last a full year, and the Middle Eastern conflicts with the US that followed haven't lasted 30. 
Compare and contrast this to the Roman-Persian Wars, which lasted in total 681 years. With the Middle East being a fair battleground between our two combatants, we now need to look at the combatants themselves. Who exactly are we dealing with here? What are their skills, the loadout, and do either of them have any little tricks up their sleeves? First, let's take a look at your standard Roman legionary. We're not talking about a gang of reckless, greedy sellswords here, nor are we discussing a terrified gang of teenagers drafted into service by an oppressive ruler. Roman legionnaires were volunteer troops, half from Rome proper and half from other territories in the empire, referred to as the auxilia. These soldiers are highly trained, highly organized, and highly motivated, both by a sense of national and military pride or, in the auxilia's case, the opportunity to be rewarded with full-blown Roman citizenship and the status and wealth that came with being a highly regarded member of the empire's heavy infantry. The Roman Empire was actually more progressive than many of today's world powers and the monetary bonuses they offered to their soldiers as motivation for their service. And of course, while being well motivated and having a good payment plan won't necessarily give our Roman underdogs the edge over an M1 Abrams tank, it certainly won't hurt their chances either. Soldiers that actually want to fight tend to fight better than conscripted armies. Now we know the Roman legionnaires were highly trained and revered infantrymen, but what about their actual equipment loadout? Well, in terms of armor, your standard Roman legionary would typically be fit with a chainmail underlayer, topped either by shoulder pads or in more extreme cases the army's trademark lorica segmentata. This is the term for the steel strips folded into light but powerful body armor, the appearance of which is actually pretty synonymous with the mental image of a Roman soldier, from gladiator to Monty Python. They also wore helmets that covered their entire head, brow, and neck, leaving only the face exposed. Down below they kept it pretty simple with a leather belt and hobnailed sandals. Another iconic element of the Roman legionary armor is the scutum, a huge curved rectangular shield formed of densely packed layers of plywood, allowing the legionary to not only shield their entire body but to form complex shield structures with their fellow legionnaires, though we'll delve more into that later. Equally important as the defense is the Roman legionary's capacity for offense. That's right, we're talking weapons. What kind of weapons did these legends of the military world wield, and would they hold any water against the M1 Abrams tank? For warriors so feared, the Roman legionnaires kept things pretty minimalist in their weaponry. Each legionary carried two javelins known as pilums designed with an armor-piercing pyramidal head on the end of a long metal shaft. Legionnaires would be trained to throw these javelins with devastating accuracy, before charging into battle whatever's left at close range. This they do with the help of their gladius, a short sword designed for stabbing rather than hacking or slashing. As a last resort, the standard legionary is typically packing a pugio, a stout dagger designed once again for stabbing. Considering that most of the Roman army's offensive potential is based around stabbing, how would they fare against an enemy that could not be stabbed, such as an M1 Abrams tank? We've seen what the Roman legionnaires are capable of. Now let's take a look at the M1 Abrams, also known as the M1A2 Abrams main battle tank. This piece of terrifying hardware has been a mainstay of the US ground force since the 90s. Operated by a crew of four, this tank is capable of moving at max speeds of 42 miles per hour or 69 kilometers per hour thanks to its 1500 horsepower gas turbine engine, almost double the speed of the fastest human ever measured. Considering the Roman legionnaires are literally foot soldiers, being massively outpaced by a far stronger foe definitely isn't a good sign. But things will get worse for our plucky legionnaires. When you consider the Abrams armor, weighing 68 tons, the tank boasts thick metal armor designed to withstand improvised explosive devices, rocket-propelled grenades, and enemy tank fire. The latest iteration is also fitted with M250 six-barreled smoke grenade dischargers, allowing it to create a blinding smoke screen around itself at a moment's notice. A thrown pilum is likely to inflict the same damage as flicking a toothpick at it, much to the frustration of the unfortunate Roman legionnaires. And don't even think about going at it with a gladius unless you like the idea of being crushed. Well, that finally brings us to the weaponry you can expect from a modern M1 Abrams, namely a devastating cannon and two different but equally dangerous machine guns. There's the M256 120mm smoothbore cannon, capable of firing M829A4 advanced kinetic energy and advanced multi-purpose or amp rounds that would likely turn a gang of even the toughest legionnaires into a fine red mist. The two secondary weapons are the 12.7mm machine gun and the 7.62mm M240 machine gun, both of which could dish out a devastating level of damage to combatants without modern ballistic armor like the legionnaires. It seems like an almost depressingly one-sided battle. In theory, couldn't a single one of these high-tech death machines mow their way through the entire Roman Empire? Well, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, definitely, but the story is never that simple. 
Two key factors in this battle are numerical advantages and battle tactics. A Roman legion is formed of an impressive 5,000 troops divided into cohorts of 480, each of which is then divided into centuries of 80 to 100 troops. Much like modern infantry, this allows for not only a large overall force, but a great degree of independence between them, and that allows for impressive tactical versatility. An M1 Abrams is a devastating piece of military technology, but it can only fight one battle at a time, and its greatest defensive weapons, the smoothbore cannon and its two machine guns, have finite ammunition. Any method of defeating the M1 Abrams tank would likely lean on this vast numerical superiority, with the ability to act independently and draw the tank's attention as necessary. The problem with many of the Roman Legion's most well-known tactics is that they simply weren't designed with a combatant like a tank in mind. Take for example the testudo or tortoise formation, wherein the legion converges and interlocks their shields to deflect projectiles as they move toward their targets. While this would have worked fine for spears and arrows and other non-explosive hand-thrown projectiles, the plywood scutums wouldn't offer much protection against a hail of bullets or the blast of the tank's cannon, or even just the crushing weight of the tank's tracks. The same can be said for other traditional tactics like the triple line and wedge formation. Tanks are a piece of technology so immune to conventional weapons that a whole new class of anti-tank weaponry had to be built to deal with them. However, there is one feather in the Roman legion's cap, long-term endurance. In addition to their weaponry and armor, each legionary would carry a pila muralia, a forked pole carrying miscellaneous supplies including up to 14 days of rations, a wicker basket, a saw, a length of leather, a shovel, a sickle, and a water skin. Legionnaires would also carry a pickaxe around their belt. These supplies would not only allow the legionnaires to survive on the battlefield for two weeks, but would also give them the tools to live longer off the natural resources presented to them by the land around them. It's worth remembering that this particular showdown is happening in the mountainous terrain of the Middle East, where adaptable guerrilla-style forces have always had an advantage. The 5,000-man legion could split into small and maneuverable centuries, allowing it to wage a stealthy and covert war of attrition on the M1 Abrams from the hills, making occasional tactical sacrifices, but preserving the majority of their forces. For highly trained soldiers up against a noisy and large tank, remaining alert and hidden shouldn't be that challenging a task. An interesting fact worth remembering about the M1 Abrams tank is that much like the ammo supplies that power its dangerous weaponry, the very fuel that allows the tank to move is equally finite. The tank's engine has great mileage by all accounts, but ultimately can only really last for 265 miles before needing to refuel. And while the M1 is actually extremely versatile in its fuel it can utilize, including gasoline, diesel fuel, and jet fuel, you're highly unlikely to find any of these lying around on the battlefields of ancient Iran or Iraq. And here, the Roman Legion has its perfect advantage, because even if the tank did potentially have reserves of fuel and ammunition elsewhere, the tank would be seriously vulnerable while replenishing their supplies. If the legionnaires could keep their centuries spread out and mobile around the battlefield, considering their vast numerical advantage of 5,000 to 1, they could deplete the tank's ammunition and fuel until all that was left was a stationary metal hut. At that point, it becomes a type of battle that the ancient warriors are more familiar with, siege warfare. The Roman legion would simply camp out around the now immobilized tank, possibly even digging trenches around it with their shovels in order to further prevent its escape, until the four operators of said tank ran out of supplies like food and water. Then they'd have only two choices, go out fighting against a numerically superior force of highly trained melee combatants or surrender to the Roman forces and be captured. Either way, in spite of having inferior weapons and armor in pretty much every regard, this is how a Roman legion, through leveraging its numerical superiority and tactical flexibility, could defeat an M1 Abrams tank. The question of what these legionnaires will do with their newly captured M1 Abrams tank is probably a discussion for another video. Hungry for more tank knowledge? Check out the top 10 most powerful tanks and the deadliest tank of World War II. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.